Good evening. This is Kathleen Causey. Thank you. We are getting ready to start the Board of Education meeting for Baltimore County. So good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, Ooh. August 10th, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, which will be led by Mr. Christian Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Mr. Thomas. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held both in person and by phone by board members and broadcasted through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Files Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the August 10th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am not aware of any changes or additions to tonight's. Thank you. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Uh, Ms. Gover, do we need to do a roll call vote or it just stands as presented? Okay. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and eight, consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call on Ms. Lowry. member appointment thank you do I have a motion to approve the personal matters as presented in exhibits D-1 through D-5 so moved thank you do I have a second second, second Offerman great is there any discussion Miss Gover may I have a roll call vote please yes Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. McWilliams? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Hager? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is the administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair and members of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. There are 20 positions, so let me go through all 20. Principal of Winfield Elementary School, Assistant Principal of Fort Garrison Elementary School, Assistant Principal Glenmar Elementary School, Assistant Principal Golden Ring Middle School, Assistant Principal Pandonia International Elementary School, Assistant Principal Perry Hall Elementary School, <clears throat> Assistant Principal Pinewood Elementary School, Assistant Principal Randallstown Elementary School, Assistant Principal Sparrows Point Middle School, Assistant Principal Point Six at Watershed Public Charter School, Assistant Principal Wellwood International School, Assistant Principal Windsor Mill Middle School, 
Assistant Principal, Woodlawn Middle School, Senior Executive Director, Department of Curriculum Operations, Director of Mathematics in the Office of Mathematics, Director of Virtual Learning Program in the Office of Virtual Learning Program, Supervisor, Business Systems Food Services in the Office of Food and Nutrition Services, Supervisor in the Office of Psychological Services, Coordinator of the Virtual Learning Program Elementary School, Office of Virtual Learning Programs, and Senior Operations Supervisor in the Office of Transportation. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E-1? So moved, Offerman. Do I have a second? Second, Thomas. Any discussion? Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rouse? Yes. Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offer? Yes. Mr. Cashier? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kim? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So our recommended appointments are in alphabetical order. Our first candidate is Deborah L. Addicts. Yes, Supervisor of Business Systems for Food Services, Office of Food and Nutrition Services. Prior to this, she's the Supervisor Office of Facilities Solution. She's been with us for over 2.2 years in Baltimore County, and she has had prior experience at Johns Hopkins Medicine for 27 years. Welcome, uh, Ms. Addix. Our next candidate is Dana M. Bisker. As principal of Winfield Elementary School, she brings to us 16 years of service in Baltimore County. Prior to this, she has served as the assistant principal at Baltimore Highlands Elementary School. She has served as a classroom teacher of STAT at Powhatan Elementary School and Church Lane Elementary School. Next appointment is Michelle L. Brennan as assistant principal at Wellwood International School. She brings to us eight years of service in Baltimore County. Uh, she served as a teacher of special ed inclusion in Catonsville Elementary School, as well as a classroom teacher in Catonsville Elementary School. Our next appointment is Myra B. Byram, coordinator of the Virtual Learning Program Elementary School in the Office of Virtual Learning Programs. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. She served as the assistant principal at Forest Oak Middle School, as well as an assistant school administrator at Rolling Terrace Elementary School, an instructional specialist in the Department of Special Education, as well as the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, and she served as a resource teacher of special ed at Briggs Cheney Middle School in Montgomery County. Our next candidate appointment is Evan L. Campbell. As assistant principal at Windsor Mill Middle School, she brings to us 7.1 years of service in Baltimore County. She served as a mathematics teacher at Deer Park Middle Magnet, as well as a classroom teacher at Scotts Branch Elementary School. Our next appointment is Dominic Dixon as the assistant principal at Glenmar Elementary School. She brings two years of service in Baltimore County. She served as a classroom teacher at Jopper View Elementary School, Watershed Charter School, and she has had previous experience at Newport News Middle Public Schools and the District of Columbia, Mary McLeod Bethune Day Academy. Our next appointment is Whitney M. Elliott as the assistant principal at Perry Hall Elementary School. She brings eight years of experience in Baltimore County public schools. She served as a staff development teacher at Shady Spring Elementary, staff teacher at Shady Spring, classroom teacher at Honey Go and Gunpowder, Gunpowder Elementary Schools, and she served three years in Baltimore City Public Schools. Our next appointment is Julie W. Forbes as the director of a virtual learning program in the Office of Virtual Learning Programs. She is new to Baltimore County Public Schools. She served as a supervisor of accountability, assessment, and data management at Queen Anne's County Public Schools. 
Director of Assessment and Accountability at Fremont Unified School District, as well as serving as a principal at a junior high school, elementary school, and vice principal at a junior high and high school. She has experience as a special ed teacher and professional development management and institute director and a special education teacher for Teach for America, Pittsburgh High School and Pittsburgh Unified School District. So welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. Our next appointment is Allison Goldblum, assistant principal, Pandonia International Elementary School. She brings 17 years of experience in Baltimore County she served as the specialist in the office of Title I, classroom teacher at Reisterstown Elementary School, a technology integration teacher at Deer Park Elementary School, as well as a kindergarten teacher and classroom teacher at Timber Grove Elementary School. Our next appointment is Tiffany R. Harper as the assistant principal at Randallstown Elementary School. She brings to us 11.1 years of service in Baltimore County. She served as a classroom teacher and resource teacher at Woodholm Elementary School. Our next appointment is Dr. Jeffrey O. Holmes as the Senior Executive Director in the Department of Curriculum Operations. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools, Dr. Holmes. Uh, he served as the Chief of Schools in the District of Columbia prior to that. He served in a variety of positions in Prince George's County Public Schools, such as instructional director, principal of Longfields Elementary School, principal of Dwight D. Eisenhower Middle School, assistant principal at Longfields Elementary School, mathematics and reading teacher at Drew Freeman Middle School in James Madison Middle School, and a classroom teacher at Malton Elementary School. At, in Prince George's County Public Schools. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. Our next appointment is Ronald S. McFadden as the assistant principal at Woodlawn Middle School. He brings to us six years of experience in Baltimore County. He served as a music teacher at Southwest Academy and prior experience in Baltimore, County, Baltimore City Public Schools for four years. Our next appointment is Rachel S. Major Bosky, I apologize if I did not say that incorrectly, <laughs> uh, if I said that incorrectly, um, to assistant principal at Watershed Public Charter School. She is new to Baltimore County Public Schools. She has served as the fourth grade lead teacher at Roland Park Country School, the lower school dean, school of the cathedral for uh, several years, a fifth grade lead teacher at Garrison Forest School, and a fourth and sixth grade teacher in Baltimore City Public Schools. Our next candidate is Kasele Mashinda, Director of Mathematics in the Office of Mathematics. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. She has served as the District Mathematics Coordinator in Atlanta Public Schools, as well as instructional coach, coach at Best Academy High School in Atlanta Public Schools, teacher of mathematics at the South Atlantic School of Law, and mathematics teacher at the North Atlanta High School, as well as a mathematics teacher at Benjamin E. Mays High School, all in Atlantic, Atlanta Public Schools. Our next can, uh, appointment is Sarah Powell, Senior Operations Supervisor in the Office of Transportation. Uh, she is new to Baltimore County Public Schools. She served as the Manager of Bus Services in the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. She's had various positions such as Financial Analyst, uh, Special Coordinator for the Baltimore City Department of Transportation, the Service Monitor for the DC Circulator and the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, Operations Manager, Charter Manager, Student Manager, Student Maintenance Assistant, and even a student driver for the shuttle of the University of Maryland, University of Maryland College Park. So welcome, Ms. Powell. The next appointment is Chester A. Sanders, Assistant Principal, Pinewood Elementary School. He brings to us three years of service in Baltimore County. He was the classroom teacher at Joppa View Elementary School and had previous experience at Clark County School District for several years. The next appointment, 
Next is Sarah A. Salter, assistant principal at Fort, Fort Garrison Elementary School. She brings to us 20 years of service in Baltimore County. She was a special ed teacher inclusion at Lutherville Lab, a stat teacher at Lutherville Lab, as well as a technology integration teacher at Lutherville Laboratory. She has had classroom experience at Timonium, Reistertown, and Mars State Elementary Schools. The next appointment is Dr. Aaron R. Willer, Supervisor of the Office of Psychological Services. He brings to us 13.1 years of service in Baltimore County. He served as the school psychologist in the Office of Psychological Services. Next appointment is Matthew E. Wickman, Assistant Principal, Sparrows Point Middle School. He brings to us 9.7 years of experience in Baltimore County. He was a special ed teacher inclusion at Sparrows Point Middle School, as well as staff development teacher and stat all at Sparrows Middle, Sparrows Point Middle School. He served as a reading teacher at Kenwood High, English teacher at Kenwood High. He served as a library science teacher at Kenwood High, as well as social studies teacher at Overly High. His previous experience was at the Kip Columbus Middle School uh, for six months as well as the Israel Henry Barron High School for a year. And our last appointment is Sherry R. Williams, assistant principal at Golden Ring Middle School. She brings 11.1 years of service in, in Baltimore County Public Schools. She was the social emotional learning teacher at Northwest Academy of Health Sciences. She served as a stat teacher at Randallstown High School, English teacher at Meadowwood Educational Center, and a reading teacher at Deer Park Middle Magnet School. Can we acknowledge all of tonight's appointments? Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Williams. Okay, the, our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns, concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's board meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers were selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. So it is the practice of this board to allow elected officials to provide their comments to the board first. So we will first have our elected officials speak, and first on our list is Senator Chris West.
Thank you. Our first, I'll say it again, our first speaker is Senator Chris West, and we'd ask that all speakers keep their um, face mask on while speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to testify about the My iPass recommendations. Just last winter, this board once again reiterated its longstanding priority list for our county school capital improvement projects. Both a replacement for Towson High School and a replacement for Delaney High School were included as two of the board's top 19 priorities. And for good reason. Both schools are very old, overcrowded, and increasingly decrepit. But now the My Pass report comes out and recommends subjecting every single school in the county to a, quote, major building renovation, close quotes, within the next 15 years. The report suggests abrogating the board's carefully developed priority list and instead spending money on all 200 schools, even schools that are brand new or nearly new. In order to come up with the money to engage in major renovations of the new schools, the old schools, like Towson and Delaney, are to be given short shrift. In front of you, you should have a five-page memo authored by myself, along with State Delegates Kathy Forbes, Michelle Guyton, and Nina Mangione, and County Councilman Wade Catch and David Marks. We all agree, um, all six of us agree, that the My Pass recommendations and the feasibility studies of the various options for both Towson and Delaney contain serious flaws. The memo contains a fact-based analysis explaining the mistakes made by the authors of the My Pass recommendations and the feasibility studies. By the way, my time clock still says three minutes, <laughs> but, I, but I, I'm halfway done, so. I just want to focus on one point contained in our memo. There is a very easy fix for this entire situation that would forestall and eliminate all of the controversy and heated debate that will surely ensue if the elimination of replacement high schools for Towson and Delaney comes up for discussion and a vote. Here's the fix. According to the feasibility studies, the extra cost of replacing Towson and Delaney, instead of just renovating them, comes to merely $32 million in the aggregate. This represents just one one-hundredth of one percent of the $2.5 billion that the My Pass report proposes to spend. The My Pass report uses an arbitrary 15-year timeline for the spending. And to make ends meet and save $32 million, it downgrades Towson and Delaney to renovations instead of replacements. If you were to change the timeline to a 16-year timeline, one extra year, an extra $140 million would be available for school construction. Easily enough money to dedicate the extra $32 million to build replacement schools for Towson and Delaney. So all of the unpleasantness and controversy that's about to ensue relates to one one-hundredth of one percent of the money. It's totally unnecessary. A 16-year timeline instead of an arbitrary 15-year timeline will solve the problem and should result in consensus rather than acrimony. I thank you for your attention and your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Delegate Kathy Forbes. Good evening, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the work you're doing on behalf of the children of Baltimore County. I know it's never easy, particularly in these unprecedented times, but it is appreciated. I'm Delegate Kathy Forbes, and I represent the Towson area in the Maryland General Assembly, where I sit on the House Appropriations Committee. Before I became a delegate, I sat here in this chair as an advocate for school construction. Since 2007, I've worked with four county executives to advocate for appropriate plans that benefit all of our students. But tonight, I'm here to discuss the latest plan known as my I-Pass. While I support some of the recommendations of this plan, including the completion of the legacy projects already in the pipeline, yes, please, now, I'm very concerned about the schools and the children that my I-Pass leaves behind. As you know, this plan recommends spending $237 million on, million on renovations to 28 of our oldest and most overcrowded schools. 
If that money were split evenly, each school would receive about $8.4 million. And that might sound like a lot until you examine the real cost the county has paid for recent comprehensive school renovations. $51 million for Hereford High, $50 million for Pikesville High, and while elementary and middle schools are cheaper to renovate, they still cost about $20 million each. It's simple path, it's, I'm sorry, it's simple math. The My I-Pass renovation budget is just inadequate. The feasibility studies going on now tell you as much. But beyond the fiscal problems, there's a bigger issue. We shouldn't be renovating many of these schools in the first place. They have far outlived their usefulness, are not compatible with 21st century learning, and in many cases, they represent a danger to students, staff, and the environment. There's been a lot of talk about Towson High and Delaney, as there should be. These buildings are falling apart, but so are the other 26 schools around the Beltway that make up the managed growth list. As for, and for almost every one of the schools on that list, I can point to a Schools for Our Future project where we entirely rebuilt a school of the same age. Owings Mills Elementary School was built in 1926. That's the same year Dundalk Elementary School was built. But in 2019, we replaced Dundalk with a brand new school. Gunpowder Elementary School was built in 1907. 1970. That's the same year Deer Park Elementary School was built, but as of right now, the county is only building a brand new Deer Park Elementary School. Rogers Forge Elementary School was built in 1951, and that's the same year as Westtown Elementary School. But in 2017, we replaced Westtown Elementary with a brand new school. The children at these 28 aging schools deserve the same learning environment as those in our recently built or renovated schools, and my iPass does not give it to them. This is a once in a generation opportunity to lay the groundwork for true 21st century schools for every child in every zip code. With the recent passage of the state's Built to Learn Act, there is funding available to address the county's most dire needs. I urge you to reject my iPass as it's written and as you have done so many times before, do the right thing for the students in the Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Delegate Michelle Guyton. Good evening. Good evening. I am Delegate Michelle Guyton, and I'm here on behalf of my many constituents in District 42B who are part of the Delaney and Towson High School communities. So as a, a former member of the State Board of Education, I also want to say that I understand how difficult your work is, and I am really, really appreciative of your time and your attention tonight. As you know, you've heard a lot about this, Delaney and Towson communities have been advocating for a comprehensive solution to their aging infrastructure and overcapacity since 2014. Since 2017, the Board of Ed has continually called for the replacement of both schools in both the county and the state capital requests. So why has that changed when also since 2017, the schools have gotten older, they have gotten more crowded, and three county executives have pledged themselves to support replacements. In fact, <clears throat> I want to say that there is, there is nothing in the feasibility or the numbers, excuse me, the feasibility study Apologies. or the numbers before you today um, which I believe I've also seen the same, that um, justify a shift from a replacement to renovation for these two high schools. In fact, given how very close these estimates are for a new replacement versus renovation, how long a renovation will take, and the ongoing increased maintenance and efficiency problems associated with a renovation over a replacement, it is honestly surprising that this board would consider renovation a viable or fiscally responsible solution. But it's also not an environmentally responsible solution. And so I know that you have the cost in front of you, but I want to point out one thing that's particularly troublesome. In this state, particularly in the General Assembly of Maryland, we're actively seeking ways to increase green construction of our public buildings. We want to, to lower operating and maintenance costs, 
and move towards a green Maryland. The operating and maintenance, maintenance costs presented for Delaney High School, and if you, if you have these in front of you, show a $45 million increase for new construction over a comprehensive renovation, and that just doesn't make sense. So I would ask this board to dive deeper into those numbers, because in fact, we've seen that new schools built throughout the state can have a zero carbon footprint, but not be more expensive. So we have the opportunity to take the leadership of this in Baltimore County. Not only does it save taxpayers money over the life of the building, it's an environmental win and provides the most modern learning environment for our children. So I do want to say that on a personal note, my children attended Hereford High School during a five, $51 million renovation that took over four years. Sorry, it's a little Apologies. distracting in this, <laughs> in this building today. So it took over four years, $51 million, which isn't anywhere near the amount of money and the type of renovation that we're talking about here today for Delaney and Towson. It impeded school programming. It was unsafe for students. An air conditioning unit fell through the ceiling into a classroom, right? So um, we have the opportunity here to do a replacement, particularly on the Delaney High School site that can go up next to the original building. The students can remain safe in the school and they can move into the new building in 30 months rather than the five years that we're looking at for renovations. So I hope that you will consider all of these things in your de decision making here today. So the ultimate responsibility, in my opinion, of a, a Board of Education member is to provide students optimal, favorable conditions for learning. A school building can be a safe and enriching environment or it can throw up barriers to a student's educational success. It can also affect staff and community morale. So now is the time for the Board of Education and the county executive to do what is needed and right for our students. And respectfully, I am asking you on behalf of my constituents to reject the recommendations to renovate Delaney High School and Towson High School in favor of the replacement schools. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Councilman David Marks. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, uh, Superintendent Williams, and members of the Board of Education. First of all, thank you for your service during difficult and unprecedented times. Thank you for the ability to testify tonight, and thank you for listening to the parents and others who will come after me and dialoguing with them about their concerns. Adoption of the multi-year improvement plan for all schools, in my opinion, in its current form, will be a disservice to the students and educators of Baltimore County. There are some very positive things in this document, and I would like to thank you for supporting a look at our school needs. Like Delegate Forbes, I have served on the Baltimore, I have sat in this seat before I was ever elected to public office. I've served on the Baltimore County Council since 2010. Since that time, Baltimore County Public Schools and Baltimore County government prioritized improvements in two main areas. First, air conditioning as many campuses as possible. Second, improving elementary and middle schools. When former County Executive Kevin Kamenetz launched Schools for Our Future, the assumption was that once we addressed urgent elementary and middle school needs, we would turn our attention to high school projects. The SAGE group was commissioned to recommend a vision for high school construction. And like many parents and students and educators, I crowded into places like Carver High School where we gave our input on high school needs. That report seems to have been discarded. Instead of prioritizing high school needs, MIAPIS takes what should be, in my opinion, a targeted approach and scatters the county's priorities, not addressing our critical needs at the high school level, but instead creating a list of dozens of other school projects. In my opinion, with respect, it shortchanges the students, faculty, and parents at places like Delaney and Towson High Schools. Many of them are asking what in the world will it take for these two schools, among the most deteriorated in Baltimore County, and in the case of Towson, severely overcrowded, to finally be prioritized. My, my office also punts on the need for a new Northeastern High School. 
I have been working on this issue for more than 20 years. Through my colleague, Councilwoman Bevan's efforts, land has been identified for a new high school in the White Marsh area, and this should be given stronger consideration in the report. The Board of Education is not obligated to follow the MIAPIS recommendations. The Board is obligated by policy and law to make fiscally responsible, data-driven decisions that are in the best interest of students. The prior Board rejected a limited renovation of Lansdowne High School because it was determined to not fully meet the needs of students. That is the case here. The County Council has taken significant steps to try to help advance new high schools. In 2019, I sponsored legislation that enacted impact fees on developers, the first time in Baltimore County. The County Council is also looking at the recommendations of the Adequate Public Facilities Task Force. And the infusion of the Built to Learn Act funding from the state level will give us resources in later years to advance long overdue projects. But it will take a disciplined approach that prioritizes school construction. I urge you to support new schools for Towson and Delaney High School and an incremental process that leads us to a new Northeastern High School. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify tonight. And again, thank you for your service to the children, educators, and families of Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Col Colleen Honorado speaking on behalf of Delegate Kathy Zaliga and Delegate Lauren Arakin. Good evening. Uh, my name is Colleen Honorato. I am Delegate Lauren Arakin's Chief of Staff. I'm uh, here on her behalf. She's actually stuck in traffic in the storm right now. Um, but I just wanted to read a letter uh, that she had written to you. It was recently announced that Baltimore County Public Schools will require all students, staff, and visitors to wear face masks during the fall 2021-2022 school year. I, along with many parents and students of Baltimore County, was livid to hear about Baltimore County Public Schools' decision. This policy is nothing short of child abuse. Children should never be forced to cover their faces for any reason. A number of peer-reviewed studies show that masking is not only ineffective, but causes significant harm to children. One CDC study showed that 85% of participants who contracted COVID during the July of 2022 reported often or always wearing a mask. Another peer-reviewed journal study from the Journal of American Medical Association stated the following, carbon monoxide mixes with fresh air and it elevates the carbon dioxide content of inhaled air under the mask. It was more pronounced in the study for younger children. This leads in turn to impairments that attribute to hyper hypercapnia. This recent review concluded that there was ample evidence for adverse effects of wearing such masks. Many governments have made nose and mouth coverings for, for students compulsory. The evidence base for this is weak. A large scale survey in Germany reports that adverse effects in parents and children using the data of 29,000 children has shown that 68% of the participating children had problems when wearing nose and mouth coverings. We suggest that decision makers weigh the hard evidence before these experimental measures accordingly are placed on our children. Why does Baltimore County Public Schools continue to cherry pick which masking research and ignore the real harm that we're doing to masking children? Additionally, this decision gives the public a sense that Baltimore County Public Schools has a complete lack of faith in the COVID-19 vaccine. Three different types of vaccines are widely available, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. Those are, who are at risk or afraid of COVID-19 have the option to choose any of these vaccines. According to the CDC's website, COVID-19 vaccines are effective against severe disease and death from variants of the virus that cause COVID-19 currently circulating in the United States including the Delta variant. Dozens of families have reached out to me since your decision. I am actively encouraging every single one of those families to withdraw their students immediately if this mask mandate is not rescinded. The enrollment numbers will be proving that. There's another, the reports from 2020, based off of the September 30th, 2019 numbers, about five months before Governor Hogan declared the state of emergency, Baltimore County Public Schools had 11 I'm sorry, excuse me, had 115,038 students. It was projected that it would have 116, 610 students by 2020. As of September 30th, 2020, Baltimore County Schools had a mere enrollment of 111,084 students. They did not meet that projection. That's because they lost 3,954 students. 
That's about 3.44% of the 2019 enrollment. I urge you to please rescind this forced masking policy. It is child abuse to make these children sit in their desks all day with masks over their faces. Thank you all very much and have a nice evening. Thank you. I now call on our stakeholder group leaders to speak. And our first stakeholder group leader is Mr. Billy Burke. Good evening, Mrs. Scott, Mrs. Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you tonight. This week is week five for me as executive director of CASE, and I'd like to share with you the concerns my members have brought forward. Every time I speak to you as the, director, as the executive director of CASE, I would like to share with you that CASE would like a seat at the table as plans and all sorts of decisions are made. The employees and families are nearest the work and will need to implement the changes. When we are not included from the beginning, you miss the opportunity to create buy-in and to hear possible obstacles from the practitioners. There should be a simple cycle for implementing changes. Staff and stakeholders should create options to be implemented. Options should be shared with staff and the public. Feedback should be collected and analyzed for practicality. Appropriate changes should be made based on time and resources. And then the plan is announced. Very often the plans are designed without our input and we are asked to review moments before the plan is announced. Everyone is left without time to process and problem solve to ensure a strong implementation. Case administrators are concerned about hiring staff in time to open school. There was a great number of resignations and retirements this year. We recognize we have just completed two of the hardest years in educational history, but we need to become more strategic in our retention and recruitment efforts. Case is encouraged that experienced senior staff has been assigned to work on recruitment and retention. One of the most fulfilling parts of my job is to address member concerns. Most concerns center around unrealistic workloads. When staff contact me, I am inspired by the passion and work ethic they bring to their jobs. Consistently, case members bring me problems, but they also bring me multiple solutions. Staff have been, been performing under great pressure for the last two years. Diamonds are formed under great pressure. Case members are diamonds. We can't afford to lose any additional priceless resources. I believe unrealistic workloads is directly related to resignations and retirements. It is time to seriously plan to reduce inefficiencies. CASE will be forming a work group to examine what we need to keep doing, what we need to stop doing, and what we need to begin doing in order to make our jobs more manageable. Thank you. Our next speaker is um, for our stakeholder group is Claire Cabral. Ms. Cabral. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Williams and esteemed board members. I bring greetings on behalf of the officers of the Baltimore County Student Councils, including myself as Vice President, President Samantha Warfall, Community Outreach Director Carter Bohart, and Second Vice President Anissa Khalil. 
BCSE has been preparing for the upcoming school year as we transition back to in-person learning. As an officer team, we have finalized appointments to our executive board and committees. We look forward to working with the student leaders across the county to grow in training and leadership and are excited to expand our team. The BCSC officer team has also been hard at work brainstorming and planning for our events this year. We are currently in the process of arranging our general assembly meetings and fall camp through a virtual platform. However, we hope to do so through groups of student council students within a classroom, uh, not individuals at home to take advantage of the opportunities that we do have to be in school. Connectivity will be essential this year as we transition back to in person. We are also thrilled to announce the beginning of a new group as well, the Baltimore County Junior Councils, which will serve as the middle school student council organization for BCPS and counterpart to BCSE. We held elections for this group in the spring and have been hard at work to prepare them to succeed this year. We look, we look forward to continuing to foster our relationship with these amazing middle school students. To reach a broader array of student perspectives across the county this year, BCSE's Board of Selected Students will be expanded to include two students from each secondary school, with an option for student council advisors to appoint a student council representative to the board. Additionally, the student member of the board, Christian Thomas, will be given the opportunity to host a 30-minute SMOB forum prior to the meeting to collect more student voices and perspectives. BCSE is excited to expand our connection with all students and look forward to releasing applications for this group soon. Lastly, I'd like to remind you that every student across BCPS has been impacted and has reacted to the changes that COVID-19 presented this past year differently. We all have struggled and have looked for someone to make the best possible decisions for us to succeed. I ask that all of you keep us in mind throughout this upcoming school year and value our voices and perspectives. Students feel the impact of the board's decisions the most and must always be put first. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Roa Hassan. Good evening, Madam Chair, Superintendent Williams, and members of the BCPS Board of Education. My name is Roa Hassan. I'm a rising junior at Perry Hall High School, and most importantly, I'm a student, your largest and most important stakeholder. I realize that you haven't heard my voice or my peers' voice as much as you've listened to others in the past, but I and so many other powerful young people are screaming out from our classrooms. We are calling out to you from our schools that lack proper air conditioning. We are calling out from under a pile of expectations that include zero considerations for mental wellness. And we are calling, oh, sorry. We echo your names as we go into the next step of our lives unprepared with a secondary education dictated not by today, but by the generations before us. Despite our calls, students like this mob, students like myself and my peers find ourselves static. We are seeing absolutely no positive change on our Board of Education. Today and every day, I remind you that every decision you make affects 111,000 students. Every single administrator you appoint is there to serve us, and each curriculum you approve impacts our abilities to progress into this world as global citizens. When I watch Board of Education meetings, parents usually give public comments. They are parents who have not experienced today's education system firsthand and have not likely experienced any public school education in at least the past 20 years. Yet I am immersed in your education system. While many of you have not had the pleasure of entering our classrooms and learning, I am in your classrooms every single day. My future is on the line. I may not pay your bills, but students like myself are why you have a title. I am why this board exists and, you are the, and, I am the, and we are the voice you are so quick to diminish. The student voice, however, does not simply include one demographic. Each and every single student endures their own systemic challenges, and therefore, if you are not serving students of color, low-income students, queer students, and disabled students equally, I am appalled to call you members of this Board of Education. Likewise, if you are not allowing us to learn of our diverse identities and allowing us to hear stories that reflect our student population, I am saddened to say you lack complete consideration for the multitudes. I see how your decisions affect the discussion of stigmatized topics. I see how your decisions affect the inequitable funding within our school system. I see your marginalization. 
We, the students of BCPS, are tired of your inaction. We are tired of being an afterthought to those in this room who refuse to consider the student voice. We are not done fighting for our power. Moving towards positive prospects for all students begins with our collaboration and demands active listening and respect from all involved. Board members, I hope you remember the positions you hold and for whom. I can only urge you to hear, to hear all of our phenomenal students because none of us are done speaking. It is an uphill battle for equality and equity, let alone completing our ac academic responsibilities. Fight for us just as we are fighting for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Mr. Bash Farone. Sorry, Mr. Uh, Ferrone is speaking on behalf of the Central Area Advisory Council. Yes, thank you. It's nice to be here. On 8-4-2021, the five members plus seven prospective members attended our meeting. Four of the prospective possible members accepted to be members if the Board of Education approved them. The Central Area Council is basically, if you approve all the prospectives, will be membered by highly educated members, and it spans from law to finance, education, system, geology, engineering, physics, science, mentorship, and of course, healthcare. Our newly designed Facebook page would be used only for advertisement for our meetings. In our last meeting, the quality of the educational system has been discussed, and the members basically recommend for you, the board, number one, face-to-face -face education plus online as needed. Two, take safety measures in the school system for all. Three, add more foreign languages options and expand on student exchange program. Four, entice STEM alternative education and use the talent of retired educators. Five, be flexible and retain effective, talented, and enthusiastic teachers. Six, secure more funding for effective teachers. Eight, listen to student compliments and complaints. Nine, improve online and online education. So in summary, the council basically asks you, the board, to listen to the students, to retain the enthusiastic and effective teachers, to seek the funds necessary, and to add the foreign languages, which I recommend all the G7 languages plus the Chinese language. Our next meeting is September 1st. Any new members interested in being a member, please call me at 410-241-1670. My number has been public for 25, 30 years, and I don't mind sharing it with the public. Thank you all for what you do. Thank you. And next we have Ms. Cindy Sexton from TABCO. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chair Han, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. As we gear up for the beginning of the school year, the excitement is almost palpable. Educators can't wait to be back in the classroom with their students. This school year will be much closer to typical with students and staff in buildings, but it will have challenges that the ongoing pandemic continues to bring. While you're on mute is surely one of the most uttered phrases we've all said and heard over the past 17 months, so are the words, the situation keeps evolving. 
TABCO's position continues to be a safe reopening based on the science. The mask mandate is following that science and will be one layer in the mitigation that will be so important in protecting against COVID. TABCO supports the layered mitigation it will take as these layers, masks, hand washing, proper ventilation and more, are needed to keep our students in the schools this year. We appreciate that the mandate was put in place with enough time for staff, students, and communities to hear and process the news so they will all be prepared when school starts. There will likely be other changes too as the year progresses. As this pandemic evolves and the scientists learn more about COVID and its variants, there may be need to be changes in what we are doing in our schools and work sites to keep everyone safe. Please be sure that the unions are part of these conversations from the beginning. Our educators are in there with our students. We know what is happening in the classrooms. Let us be a part of what may need to change so that we can continue to keep our students in school. Clear, consistent communication that has been crafted collaboratively will go a long way in ensuring that we as Team BCPS keep our collective focus always on what is best for our students. We are looking forward to an exciting year full of learning and growing. We can't wait to see our students. Thank you. Thank you. So next is general public comment. And our first speaker is Ms. Jen Reed Holm. Thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. I feel so excited we're finally back in person. What took so long? I would like to speak about the detriments of masking students, especially for our special needs children who often have social delays. Unfortunately, our special education department has not always been the brightest star in our school system. I will give you a brief history of my personal experience, which is very similar to many others. I have fought for years to get my son the help he needs since before pre-K. Did you know by the very end of his elementary school experience, he was diagnosed with seven learning disabilities and disor disorders? Seven. How was that missed for seven years that he attended his school? Then, he was, then when we asked for him to repeat fifth grade, we were flat out told no. So he missed all of the early interventions. When we saw things not going well in middle school, we looked at every private and special needs area within a reasonable distance from our home. None of them would take them, take him for various reasons. He either had too many disabilities, he had the wrong type of disability for their school, his IQ was way too high, he's very smart by the way, they couldn't handle a specific disability, and the list of excuses and reasons go on. <laughs> For three years, we have watched him struggle. Of that time, school was closed for more than a year. And you may be saying to yourself, well, that doesn't really count. Everyone was struggling, and services were barely available during that time. But what BCPS failed to do was step up their game to make sure that those kids who have delays and educational struggles were taken care of. You failed at every single level. Do you know what I did during the pandemic? I get cut my work hours to practically nothing so I can attend eighth grade again as an adult this time. I sat with my child in every single class and walked him through step by step so he can actually receive an education. This was your job and you failed. Cameras and mics were not required and were barely used. This was detrimental to his social development. But he, but he did make the honor roll for the first time this past year. But who are we kidding? I made the honor roll. He did not have the ability to do that on his own. Now we're preparing him to enter high school, and again, we asked for him to re repeat a grade. This time, it's eighth grade. We were convinced it was not in his best interest to do so. so. Even though he failed just about every class he had for the last two quarters of this year, but somehow it was okay to put him on the conveyor belt to high school. I don't get it. When peers and teachers are masked, many special needs students are unable to determine another person's feelings or interpret the meaning of what they say when their face is covered. According to the American with Disabilities Act, government agencies must make reasonable accommodations for Americans who have disabilities regarding face masks. Considering the impact on social development with students with disabilities and that there's no mask mandate, mandate, yep, in Maryland, no mask mandate. Please consider making masks a choice for families. Stop moving the goalposts on these kids. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Mary Taylor.
Good evening. My name is Mary Taylor, and I'm here representing 4,200 parents and students from the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition, Superintendent Williams, and the Board of Education. As parents and concerned residents, we strongly request that you reverse your July 28 decision requiring face masks to be worn by K through 12 for this fall. We feel that this should remain a choice to mask or unmask depending on the needs and requirements of children and their parents. And with new data revealing the dangers of masking school children, we believe the risk far outweighed the benefits. Children do not readily acquire COVID, very low risk even for Delta, spread to other children or teachers or endanger parents or others at home. And there are also neurological studies showing how the long-term wearing of face masks can damage the developing brain. Health considerations for face mask wearing are different for children than adults. And with 111,000 students in BCPS, this is a very serious matter. And now that you're asking for students to mask for an entire school week with full-time hours, this would be in all intent and purposes become a medical experiment. Long-term health effects of 40 hour per week face mask wearing for BPC, BCPS students. Dr. Williams, we expect you to provide us with a thorough risk-benefit analysis of the protective benefit of face masks versus the risk of infection, which you should be using to base your decision on, including the seriousness of infection itself in K-12 through children from COVID, including the Delta variant. We request that you employ the assistance of an unbiased third-party expert, preferably a PhD in epidemiology, that can assist you in this analysis. And if you state that many people under the age of 18 can get COVID, we need to know what cycle threshold of the RT-PCR is being used to determine this diagnosis, how many cases per location, the time period, and if they were symptomatic or asymptomatic. Also, if they had symptoms, what were they and what was the final outcome? If your risk benefit analysis, you also need to weigh the collateral risk and side effects in children wearing face masks for long periods of time. There's long mental health concerns, including irritability, headache, difficult concentrating, less happiness, reluctant to go to school, especially kindergartners, malaise, impaired learning, and drowsiness of fatigue. We implore you, BCPS superintendent and members of the Board of Education, unmask our children, allow them a choice. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eileen Turong. Not on this side. Good evening. My name is Eileen Trong, mother of three children and two of whom are students of PCPS. Tonight I am here to express my disapproval to your mask mandate for the fall. Currently, the governor and state health department do not have mass mandate or other restrictions in place due to these facts and statistics. We have one of the highest vaccination rate in the country with over 93% of male and seniors are vaccinated. 77.9% of male and adults are vaccinated and the state continue to sustain a daily vaccine rate of more than 11,000 shots per day. Hospitalization down 83% from their peak, deaths down 94% from their peak. According to the Maryland COVID statistic, children aged 0 to 19 have a survival rate of 100%. It is also universally proven and acknowledged that children are among the least susceptible to COVID-19 or contributor to community transmission. In addition, in June 2021, the FDA has announced that the PCR test has failed the approval for COVID-19 testing because it does not differentiate the flu or the COVID-19. The only test of it is, is a genomic test that is solely being conducted at high level labs such as the CDC. The CDC has also announced that it is withdrawing the RT-PCR diagnostic panel on December 31st, 2021. Unless PCPS, along with the health department statewide and locally, can prove to me that you have the tests that can detect just COVID and able to produce the accurate number of infections. Until then, you cannot make decisions based on flawed data and fear. There's also no scientific evidence that proves masks are effective in preventing COVID, and forcing them on children is abusive. 
Education is a human system. The children deserve a nurturing, positive, natural, and healthy environment to meet their needs, to help them maximizing their learning ability and growth. They do not deserve to be isolated, muzzled, and conditioned under falsehoods. Vaccines are plentiful, and anyone can get it at any time in many places if they wanted to, for free. If we believe in science vaccine, then there's no reason for the mask. The reinstating of the mandate is anti-science, anti-fax, anti-vaccine, and discouraging people from wanting to take it. My children will go to school without masks due to both religious and medical exemptions. The pandemic is over. The choice of masking children should rest on the parents now and not the school system or government. We are prepared to challenge the system on this decision with facts, science, the law, and our God-given constitutional right. You all should resign. If you don't care about the children, you all should resign. You're not making the system better. I yield my time. Our next speaker is Ms. Amy Adams. Good evening. I'm thrilled to see you all in person. This is a first for me because um, until March 2020, I was blissfully unaware of the role of the Board of Education. My three kids have had wonderful experiences with their dedicated teachers in our local schools. Then the pandemic hit, and I have watched every BOE and committee meeting since May 2020. I'm trying to understand how our school system runs. I tried to contact you, excuse me, I tried to understand how our leaders, including our Board of Education, makes decisions that directly affect our kids and our family. I tried to contact you as an individual to gain knowledge and insight and become a more informed parent. When I got little response, I started asking other parents in my area questions, and many of them had the same thoughts and concerns. This is how we formed our group, the Parent and Student Coalition. We came together to share information, have discussions, and provide support to one another. And guess what? We're still here. Our intention is not to be an adversary to BCPS. Our kids are in the system. We want it to be successful. Our intent is to pay attention to your decisions, your policies, and ask questions or raise concerns when we have them. We want to be a partner with you, and if you believe in the community engagement policy, why would that not be welcomed? We are in a very different place than we were in August 2020. We now have the opportunity for anyone over 12 to get the vaccine. I know it's hard to sometimes take, take a step back and see the bigger picture, but outside of Maryland, Many school districts operated all last year, pre-vaccine availability, five days a week. If school systems around the country were successful, were successfully able to stay open last year, BCPS can surely do it this year. I want to believe you're committed to five days a week and 180 days of school. I want to believe that you're committed to running after school extracurricular activities for the kids. I want to believe that you will remove the mask mandate when the community metrics show. I want to believe that if a child tests positive for COVID, they won't be sent home for 10 days with no type of educational instruction. But in order to have confidence in the system, we need you all to work with us. Use the data to explain the policy changes. We understand, we need to understand the plan for our kids. Please educate us. Who is making policy related to COVID safety and mitigation? Is it the school board's role to develop and vote on policy? Is it Dr. Williams' role as an executive to execute the policy? Why is it that Dr. Williams is making policy changes and announcements prior to board voting on it? Your role as leaders is to step back and make decisions based on data, not anecdotal stories or personal experiences. Please explain to us tonight the details of the upcoming year. We want our kids in school five days a week with their dedicated teachers and professionals. We want our kids to grow academically, socially, and emotionally. We want our kids to feel confident and safe attending school. We also want to discuss other non-COVID concerns with you. Academic performance data, curriculum questions, school safety. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have uh, Mr. Andrew Worthington. Good evening, thank you to the Board of Education for this opportunity to speak, Dr. Williams, Chairwoman Scott, Mr. Thomas, thank you. My name is Andrew Worthington, I've been a teacher at Baltimore County Public Schools for 10 years. I'm not here as a representative of Baltimore County, my school or its administration. 
I'm here solely as an individual educa educator that considers themselves actively engaged in anti-racist and abolitionist teaching. Someone that has not been perfect, someone who is not trying to be a savior, and someone who, like many of us, is still learning. I am concerned about the rhetoric about the book stamped from the last public comment section in July. So I'm here to speak out in contrast to those comments by someone who I once called a colleague but cannot right now because it is obvious that we are not currently engaged in the same work. The concerns expressed during the July meeting's public comment involved the book Stamped being used as a resource in a pilot curriculum this upcoming school year, and the comments continued this already worn out and uninformed complaint over critical race theory. I want to say this explicitly as someone who has thoroughly read Stamped and has worked in this district for 10 years. Stamped does not teach the reader to hate any group of people based on their race. It is critical of individuals throughout our history, both black and white, and their individual ideas and actions throughout this nation's history. We as educators are asked to engage students in experiencing and considering multiple perspectives. We as educators are tasked with building students' critical thinking skills, and we as educators are responsible for ensuring students consider multiple sides of an argument or a topic. Having students listen to and consider diverse experiences and perspectives, whether you agree with them or not, is not critical race theory. Stamped is not critical race theory. Stamped offers a different perspective on U.S. history, a perspective that has historically been silenced, whitewashed, lynched, murdered. The burden of educating white folks should not fall solely on our black friends and colleagues, so I want to make an offer to anyone that can hear me in this room, online, and even the folks outside who uh, joined us earlier. If you can message me either through Gmail or on Twitter, at a.worth, that's A-D-O-T-W-O-R-T-H, either at Gmail or on Twitter. If you can message me your definition of critical race theory, what it means to you and what concerns you, I will purchase a copy of Stamped and lend it to you to read. When you've finished, we can discuss how the book meets your understanding of critical race theory and your concerns. I'm happy to listen to you. I'm happy to talk with you. No judgment. I simply ask that you read Stamped before making any further public comment inciting fear over critical race theory, and now you have one less excuse not to. The students are leading, and I am part of a group of teachers who will ensure that you continue to listen. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have um, Ms. Kwan Wilson. Juan Wilson. Okay, we can come back. Um, next, we have Mr. Matt Gresnick, or Gresick. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> come on, we ran together. <laughs> we just get set here. Good evening, Board of Ed, Chair, and Dr. Williams, wherever you went. Um, my name is Matt Gresick. I'm a teacher, also a candidate, uh, former candidate for Board of Ed and a father of two kids that go to Baltimore County Public Schools. I would first like to voice my support for the mask mandate and commend the leadership that implemented the policy that will mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and its variants. Hundreds of doctors across the country have signed letters petitioning local school systems that have not implemented similar initiatives. The common theme of those letters is, optional masking is simply not sufficient, as masks are most effective when all parties are wearing them. Parents, students, and staff should not be given the choice to mask when this choice endangers the health of other children and staff, states a letter to Mason City School District leaders in Ohio. Please continue to follow science so we can keep our kids, kids staff, and families as safe as possible. Secondly, 
I commend and encourage you to continue to support your educational staff in the honest discussions that they are having with their students concerning race, equity, equality, liberty, and other controversial topics in history that encourage civic discussion and promote an active citizenry. Structural and systemic racism are real problems of our society with historical evidence to support those conclusions. The recent manufactured controversy over critical race, th race theory is meant to instill fear in educators and limit those discussions, lessons, and activities. They are the very foundation of our democracy. And finally, it has come to my attention that several teachers have yet to receive their back pay from the malware attack numerous months ago. Can we please, please honor their commitment and contract by paying them what they're due? And we should pay them more <laughs> because they could invest that money in something else. But just let's make this right uh, for them. And finally, thank you for your time. Thank you for your commitment. This is not easy what you're doing um, right now. And uh, God bless you all. That's it. Thank you. And next we have um, Mr. Bashroom. I like to talk to you about money. The CBO estimated that the U.S. spent $2.4 trillion on the war of Afghanistan. The total expenditure of the U.S. war in Iraq and Afghanistan is $6 trillion and counting. That's six with 12 zero to the right of it. The average cost of a building a new public school according to Google, is $27 million. So in that, if you divide $6 trillion, which is spent on a war that we have nothing to show for at all, divided by 27 million, that will give us about 223,000 schools that we can build across the U.S. And of course, we get a portion of that. We cannot really protect Congress, it's a fact. We don't have adequate schools, Lansdowne, Lansdowne Towson, Delaney, etc. We cannot really truly retain effective teachers, but we can launch forces and cause disasters in the Middle East. I have been with this board for more than 20 years. The problems the board has is lack of adequate funding. In 2004, when I started, it's the same. Today, it's the same. The faces are changing. Politics and religion in the school system is harmful. I've seen it. What I ask you as board members to switch gear a little bit and lobby our two senators and our multiple Congress people to be against foolish wars, just like the $6 trillion, and put that money in the education system. And I'm not really just talking about dollars, I'm talking about how many U.S. Marines died how many soldiers died? How many of them now in the VA system? How many of them are coming to St. Joseph and GBMC and MedStar for generations to come? And not to mention how many civilians were killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think that should be the focus. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Mr. Michael Miller. Thank you. I'm a social studies teacher at Perry Hall Middle School, one of several schools scheduled to pilot the new eighth grade U.S. history curriculum this coming school year. 
The new curriculum will view American history through the lens of critical race theory using the book stamped by Ibram X. Kendi, which I have read. This book is both racially biased and historically inaccurate, and I believe it has no place in our schools. Among the many misleading statements made in this book is the assertion that the American Revolution was fought to preserve the institution of slavery. This is the same lie put forth by the New York Times 1619 Project, which had to be edited after the objection of many historians. This is not about simply teaching a more honest view of American history, as many would lead us to believe. I do not know of a single educator who is not in favor of teaching history fully and honestly, even when it is painful. And I have never heard any of my colleagues suggest that we should minimize or deny the regrettable portions of our nation's history. But Kendi does not criticize the country, he condemns it. Obviously, our nation has a complex and troubled history when it comes to race relations, and we're still dealing with the effects of this. Doing so requires a solid foundation of historical knowledge, which this curriculum will not provide. Instead, it selectively chooses certain events in our history and presents them solely through a racial lens in the most negative light possible. Learning history this way is pushing us further from the goal of, in of an inclusive society, not closer. Our students will learn to see themselves and each other as oppressors or oppressed based on the color of their skin, rather than citizens of a free country with the power to take control of their own lives. The board's policy on equity states, quote, while complex societal and historical factors contribute to the inequities our students face, rather than perpetuating disparities, the school system must address and overcome inequality by providing all students with the opportunity to, to succeed, end quote. I believe the proposed U.S. history curriculum violates that policy. At last month's board meeting, another teacher commented on this issue and called on the board to pause the implementation of the new curriculum until the board is no longer meeting in a hybrid format and the public has been able to adequately consider and discuss the issue. Considering the unusual circumstances of the last two school years and the growing national debate over critical race theory, I believe that this request is more than reasonable. I would also like to repeat the request for each board member to publish for public review their own thoughts on how this ideology will impact students. It would be inappropriate to make drastic and controversial changes to the history curriculum at a time when the board was not meeting with the public face to face and when teachers and parents were understandably focused on other issues. Thank you. Thank you. Next is public comment on board policies and the first speaker for policy 0100 is Andrew Worthington. Hey, he may have left. We'll go on to our next speaker for policy 0100, Matt Gresick. May have left as well, okay. Our next speaker for policy 0100 is Mr. Bash Farone. Madam Speaker, I like to pass. I really didn't have time to prepare, so. Okay, thank you, Mr. Farone. Um, and then we have again uh, Mr. Michael Miller for policy 0100. He signed up again for policy. Sir, I think that we just all put 0100 on the form because it pertained to what we said before. Okay. The original statement. Thank you. All right. The next policy is policy 3800, non-instructional services. And we have Mr. Basharone. No? All of them. I would okay. okay. Thank you. The next policy is policy 4011. And um, Mr. Ferrone, you said you is out. Um, Mr. Andrew Worthington, did you want to speak to policy 4011? No? Okay, then, so then that brings us to our last policy, then policy 8601. Board member conduct, use of social media, and we have uh, Miss Amy Adams. Okay. 
Good evening again. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on policy 8601. I've listened to the policy review committee meetings in February and June when this policy was discussed. The policy was developed based on a letter from the Office of Inspector General for Education. The letter stated, a review has concluded that BCPS does not have a policy pertaining to the use of social media by a board member nor employees of BCPS. The OIGE recommends that BCPS BOE revise its current BOE handbook dated 2015 and incorporate a use of social media policy governing Board of Ed members and BCPS staff. Similar educational policies regarding the use of social media can be found on a number of local school system websites throughout the state of Maryland. At the March 23rd Board of Ed meeting, some of the members not on the committee expressed concern and asked for the policy to return to PRC for further development. At the June PRC meeting, the policy was brought up. One member reiterated some of the concerns of the general board. The other three committee members disagreed and voted to move it forward again to the full board without changes. This doesn't seem to be very functional. I fully support a social media policy for board members and any employee of BCPS. I appreciate the citations attached to board docs regarding other school system policies. The policies of other school systems referenced did not include a similar section to the section three violations of the board of the BCPS board policy 8601. Why is this necessary for our policy? Shouldn't violations for board members or any BCPS staff be considered on an individual case by case basis? And shouldn't this policy be reviewed at a PRC meeting, which doesn't happen again until September 20th prior to vote for approval of the full board? Thank you. Thank you. And that ends our public comment portion of the meeting. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies, which was postponed from the July 13th, 2021 meeting. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Policy 0100, basic board commitments, philosophy, equity. Policy 3800, non-instruction services, planning, land use, planning and zoning activities. Policy 4011, personnel. Policy 4104, personnel, conduct, technology, acceptable use policy, uh, media. Policy 5130, students withdrawal from school prior to graduation. Policy 5210, students promotion and retention. Policy 5600, students responsibilities and rights. Policy, new policy 8601, board member conduct, use of social media. The policy review committee has also moved the following <laughs> My time right <laughs> the, the policy review committee has also moved the following policies to the full board without recommendation. Policy 8221, internal board policies, duties and responsibilities, board officers, chair, vice chair duties. Policy 8311, internal board policies, operations, meetings. Policy 8314, internal board policies, operations, meetings, agenda. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit G. So may I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for- Madam Chair, can, yes. we, can we pull out 8601 to vote on that separately, please? Sorry, um, could you say that again? Could we pull out Policy 8601 and vote on that separate from the others? Okay. Okay, are there any others that we'd like to be separated? Yes, Ms. Um, 8221 and 8311. 8220. Oh, it's the next one. Oh, that's the next motion? Okay. Oh, that's right. 8221 didn't come through with the recommendation. And then what was the other one you said, Dr. Hager? Um, 8311. Okay, so both of them are the next one. No, Dr. Hager, raised mine. Oh, she raised, okay. All right. Ms. Hen? 5210. Can we separate that? 5210, okay. So we want to separate 8601 and 
Okay, then, so may I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Policy 0100-3800-4011. Four one zero four five one three zero five six zero zero, and that's it. So moved, Offerman. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Okay, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ma Madam. Excuse me, Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. Yes, Ms. Causey. I had request, yes, <clears throat> I had uh, re wanted to request to separate um, additional policies, but it was um, including the uh, policy 8311, 8314, um, 8220, 8221. Those are already, um, that's the next motion. Those are already out. They're, they're, we're not doing those yet. Those came to the came without a recommendation. Um, <clears throat> so there are so we're not we're not processing that. But we are in the middle of the vote of the ones, and it was already moved by Mr. Offerman. So a second isn't required. So if we could take a roll call vote, um, please. Excuse me. Could you restate the motion? No, so ma'am. Make sure um, your address. We're already in the middle of a motion, Ms. Causey. If you have board docs up, it's all of the policies minus 8601 and 5210. Ms. Gover, could we do a roll call vote, please, starting with Ms. Rowe? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Gover? Yes. Go to the next person, please. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Yes. Ms. Hens? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. June? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so those have moved forward. Is there any discussion on... Um, we separated out um, 8601. Let's start with that one first. Any questions on 8601? Um, yes, so I was one of the folks who, who was concerned about the consequences aspect of the um, social media language. Um, and I really appreciated the, the feedback that Ms. Howie provided, uh, specifying that there is not other um, similar consequences language in the model policies that were used that helped us to generate the social media policy. And I'm really excited about having a social media policy. But at the end of the um, overall analysis that was the addendum for this meeting, there was alternative language specified that said the board as a whole has the authority to decide whether this policy has been violated and whether censure or any other mode of discipline should be imposed. And I personally feel that that uh, is a a more acceptable uh, language in, in my mind, but I know it would go back to the PRC. So um, that's just kind of, those are my thoughts on this policy, but I was, I was disappointed that it had not, it was still verbatim the same as it was the last time it was presented to the board. Okay, so is, do you, are you offering a recommendation or language to include, or is that what you emailed over to Ms. Howie? She no, this was it. provided as an as an addendum in our documents, and so I know I know the PRC is the one who makes the ultimate decision. So I would recommend that it goes back to the PRC to include that language that, that was specified in the addendum. Mm -hmm. um, and I I know we don't make a motion for that in this session, yeah. right? So we that, can just have it go back. Exactly. Thank okay. you. I, I'm sorry. Did, did you want to say something, Ms. Howie? Yes, ma'am. Members of the board, you do have the opportunity to amend the policy in this um, in, right now, as opposed to sending it back to PRC. So it is your choice. Even if it's first, first reader? Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. Um, it sounded like Dr. Hager wants to um, amend it to the um, addendum that was added. Yes. Yes. So okay. should I make a motion to do that? Is that the better approach? Um, is it required to make a motion or as uh, if we just have consensus that we would just um, 
if there's consensus to accept the language, then as amended, it will come back to the board for second reader with the amendment. Okay. Is there consensus to accept the language? Um, can I comment on the language? Uh, yes. So well, I, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. So I understand what Dr. Hager's getting at with having the full board. But typically, if a board member does something that is considered inappropriate, the process that we use in this board is that someone would file an ethics complaint with our board's board of ethics. That board of ethics would have some sort of a ruling. And I feel that this entire policy cuts our own independent board of ethics out of the process. And when you have a full board deliberating on individual accusations against board members, that could entitle a lot of time in politicizing of the work of this Board of Education. And so I would support language that simply followed our current policies in which if we approve a policy, it is up to our current independent Board of Ethics to determine if the policy has been broken. But there are elements in this policy that I feel are vague and um, could be used against board members who have a dissenting opinion on an issue, who are simply explaining their position to their constituents and why they voted no on something, and that could be considered unsupportive of the school system or unsupportive of the board. And I feel that unless we're going to get right down to the specifics, of what constitutes is an inappropriate. I don't support the vague, broad language in this policy. And as far as the consequences section, I think that that should just be completely omitted. And if someone wants to file an ethics complaint with our independent board of ethics about an individual board member's conduct, they're perfectly free to do that. Okay. So, Ms. Thanks. Rowe, um, in the addendum that was provided to you for this meeting, uh, your concern about and your suggestion about using the ethics review panel was addressed. You would have to change your ethics code policy to expand the jurisdiction of the ethics review panel. As the policy is currently written, the ethics review panel has the authority to review complaints about violations of the ethics code, not about violations of any sort of code of conduct generally. So that would have to be amended. Then the uh, SEC has to approve the amendment to the policy before the policy can be implemented. If we went that route, I would support going that route. I don't support this. Okay, thank you. Now we had next Ms. Mack and then Ms. Hen. I believe I was next, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Hen said she was next. Thank you. Um, I also do not support this policy in its current form. However, I do agree that it's extremely important. Um, I thank Dr. Hager for sharing her questions and the responses that were provided by Ms. Howie. Um, I also agree with Ms. Rowe's comments that an independent um, body needs to be um, the deciding um, force in, in determining whether a violation of this policy has occurred. Given Ms. Howie's, Howie's feedback that this would um, constitute revision to multiple policies, including our ethics policies, I believe a working group would be appropriate to review not only this policy, but all related policies that may need to be affected. Therefore, I'd like to make a motion that we establish an ad hoc committee to look at 8601, as well as related policies that may need to be affected. So I move that we establish an ad hoc committee to look at 8601 and related policies in order to affect the changes that board members would like to make. Um, that's not a policy I believe should be brought to the floor because that's what the policy review committee does. There's that's a motion on the PRC. floor and there is a second. I've not brought that motion to the floor. I've not stated it. It's not the property of the assembly as of yet. So I'm, I'm not bringing that motion to the floor because that's what the PRC committee does. Why do we have a PRC committee? 
if uh, the, if we are going to then do the work of the PRC in another ad hoc committee. Well, may we ask legal counsel, there's a motion on the floor and there is a the second. The motion has not been brought to the floor as I've not restated the motion to bring it to the floor. So I'm refusing to bring the motion to the floor. May we consult legal counsel? Yes, Mr. Mercedes. I've made a motion. Madam Chair, it's correct. It hasn't been brought to the floor yet. The option for the board would be to overrule the, uh, take a vote to overrule the chair's position. Madam Chair. Yes. I appeal the decision of the chair not to bring the motion to the floor. Second. Okay, Ms. Gover, may we take a roll call vote, please? And the vote is on appealing the chair's decision to not bring the motion to the floor. So the motion as stated is, shall the decision of the chair be sustained? That would be the motion that the assembly is voting on. The motion that the assembly is voting on is, shall the decision of the chair be sustained? Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Brown? No. No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Mr. Jones? Yes. Ms. Penn? No. Thomas? No. Mr. Oxman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Dr. Hazen? Yes. Dr. Uh, Mr. Shear? No. Uh, yes. So I had uh, seven no's, so it would require, I believe, um, and Mr. Mercedes, correct me, two-thirds, which would be eight, in order for it to be overturned, so then the sustaining of the chair stands. Is that correct? It's, it's a majority to overturn the decision of the chair. Not two-thirds, it's a majority? Correct. Okay, so then you got, so the majority would be seven, and I believe we did get seven? Okay, so the motion of the chair has been overturned. So then we can, um, Ms. Um, Han, if you could restate your motion, please. I move that the board establishes an ad hoc committee to review policy 8601 and related policies to make recommendations to the full board. Is there a second? Second, Matt. Could you please write that so that I could properly restate it? I want to make sure we have our question. Dr. Hager, you have a question in regards to the motion? Um, I just wanted to know specifically what are the related policies? Are they the ones that are um, listed in reference? Or, yeah, what, what are the related policies? May I the ones that are listed at the bottom of the. I haven't, it hasn't come to the floor yet. I haven't stated it. Okay, so the board, the motion was made by Ms. Hen that the board establish an ad hoc committee to review 8601 and related policies in order to make recommendations to the board. And it was seconded by Ms. Mack? Okay. All right. Okay, and it looks like Dr. Hager has a question directed to the motion, and you were saying you were going to answer. Okay. Thank you. I believe that's part of the work of the ad hoc committee um, it, with the advice of Ms. Howie to um, determine which policies um, the committee would need to review. So there are four related policies listed in 8601, so, but you're saying the ad hoc committee could expand beyond those four related policies? It would start with those and then make the determination um, with the advice of Ms. Howie of any others that um, would need to be looked at. I, I, I'm generally concerned that this does overlap a lot with PRC. Mm -hmm. I have That's PRC then. Yes, Ms. Um, Jose. 
Thank you, Ms. Scott. My concern is that this board constantly forms ad hoc committees. We have an ad hoc committee currently in place for the um, handbook that's not been approved, and this is the, the paradigm of death by committees. We already have a PRC committee that reviews policies, and it could have easily gone back to the PRC committee for review and revisions. To do the work of the committee by forming an ad hoc committee is the definition of, um, I don't even know, it's so inefficient. I certainly don't support this policy. And I also want to note that this policy was asked to be formed in January of 2021, so it's almost seven months now, and we are still nowhere to even getting it approved. Um, so this is just going to further delay the formation of this policy that has been asked by for the Office of Inspector General to form guidelines. And forming guidelines, having protocol, it's normal for most elected officials, appointed officials, and professionals to have a certain decorum and guidelines. On, it's not just for this board, it's for the incoming board, it's for future boards. You set a handbook, you put in a guidelines to how to uh, go about. Social media is relatively new. It wasn't there five, ten years ago, as rampant as it is now. And by no means is this policy muzzling anybody. It, it clearly states that you can, you know, they do encourage social media usage and to be active in social media is just providing guidelines and decorum and professionalism. And I fully support the way the policy is brought through this. You know, I certainly don't support this ad hoc committee. Thank you. It's time. Thank you. In regards to the motion, um, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, I just want to state that I am in full support of the policy as it's written, um, the way that the social media policy is written. The reason that I voted um, no to the chair's decision is because I just thought that Ms. Hen should have the opportunity to have a roll call vote on, on the motion. Um, I just thought that we sh she should be able to speak to her motion and then the board should be able to talk about it. But I am in support of the policy as it's written. I do not believe there should be an ad hoc committee. Um, I just thought that it would be best for the, this to be discussed and the motion to be uh, recognized. Thank you. Ms. Mack? I am generally not in support of ad hoc committees, but in the information that Ms. Howie provided to Dr. Hager, there is a quote that said, the board members' concerns and public comment were discussed at the PRC meeting and no specific suggestions were advanced. So many of us made suggestions. We made suggestions verbally and in writing, and those suggestions were not advanced. So short of that happening, what other avenue do board members have for having their concerns addressed since they were negated by the PRC immediately after the March 23rd meeting? Ms. Rowe? Yes, my con ordinarily I would say that this overlaps with PRC as well, but given that this board has voted to send it back to PRC, and it's returned back here in the exact same form as it is, and that board members support the idea that we need a social media policy, I believe, overall. But we have many revisions and research and an understanding of this specific policy in certain terms that are overly broad, that need to be a bit more detailed to protect the civil liberties of board members and to protect board members from frivolous complaints because something like board members should always conduct themselves online in a manner that reflects well of the board is a statement that could be subjectively interpreted. And it could be subjectively interpreted according to any number of criteria and bog this board down with more work and frivolous complaints that are nothing more than political grandstanding. And to avoid that, our policies need to be clearly understood and clearly interpreted and objective. This is not an objective policy. And so if the only way we can get an objective policy is to have an ad hoc committee because we've already sent it back to PRC, then in this situation, I agree with having an ad hoc committee. Ms. Hen. Thank you, I agree with Ms. Mack's comments and Ms. Rowe's comments. We have tried, we've provided feedback, we've tried to work this policy through the channels, through the PRC, we've provided feedback in every shape or form or function, and here we are back at square one with the same exact policy that board members objected to. 
and none of our feedback was implemented at the policy review committee. This policy tries to silence board members by using fear of consequences as dire as removal from this board, and that is a policy that cannot stand. It tries to censor board members from participating in social media by anything that's deemed um, by opinion. It is subjective, as Ms. Rose stated. And until we put objective um, qualifications in here and, and put some um, spe specificity in it, that this is the feedback we've shared. And it's fallen on deaf ears. It's been ignored. It's come back exactly the way it was brought up to us originally, which was not the intent of the Inspector General's direction to us. Nowhere was that a requirement. Nowhere are the consequences provided in the examples from other school boards. This policy needs work, and if the PRC can't get it done, then we need an ad hoc to focus on it. Thank you for that. And I will speak because, um, and next is um, Ms. Pastor, um, because I think it's time for me to speak about this. The Inspector General sent a letter, and I would advise board members to go back and review that letter, not one, but two letters, about the behavior of board members who sit around this dais and conduct political grandstanding and soapboxing and intimidation and threats on social media. And we've re he's received numerous complaints about members of this board for behavior on social media. This social media policy came about because of a need based on behaviors and we it's a it's a sad state of affairs that we have to have a policy that governs the conduct because adult members of this board of education do not know how to conduct themselves on social media the exact things that you are accusing this policy of doing is exactly what you all are doing on social media and i was directed by the office of the inspector general i did not come up with this policy he said i direct the chairwoman of the board of education of baltimore county to take action, and that's what I did. And action without consequences is not action, it's inaction. I shouldn't have had to take action at all. This is ridiculous that you have to tell adults how to behave on social media because adults cannot behave on social media. It's a sad state of affairs that we even are discussing something like this. And this is what this board does when you don't like things and you don't want things to be said and you don't want things to be addressed. You form ad hoc committees so that it's not addressed. We still don't have a handbook. We still don't have a social media policy. And you know what? You said you didn't know what that's called. That's called dysfunction. Ms. Pastor, please go ahead. Thank you. Going back to Ms. Mack's comment about having submitted things and it comes back the same. I don't see that having an ad hoc committee is going to change that because recommendations will come back and we will go through this again. As Ms. Joes pointed out, we have had a handbook committee for two years and we can't move beyond. And the Office of the Internal General Education, Internal General, sort of addresses that phenom as well, that we cannot move to even get our handbook done, which includes this particular piece. So the PRC is the committee that is supposed to address it. We are having this conversation now. Let us use this conversation then to make sure that we get to the end that we need to have, which is a policy. And everybody is going to have to give up a little something and deal with the language and move on. We can't even get to a vote on this. And maybe that's where we need to go, is to have the vote and then to see where we are and who is where on it and then use that as fodder for the beginning of a conversation. But creating one more layer to essentially do the same thing is only going to bring us back here to get the same thing once more. And we have to move beyond this. We, okay, we then can we take a, a thank you for that, Ms. Pastor. I think that's, Chair, we need to take a vote. Causey, Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. I've requested uh, Yes, Ms. Causey, please go question. ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there was a question earlier about uh, what are related policies? We also have related legal um, uh, legal impacts that are referenced in the policy analysis and then in the policy. And <clears throat> nowhere in here have I seen a reference to the uh, First Amendment rights, um, which definitely needs to be considered when um, one is speaking to uh, limiting 
conversation and um, as has been pointed out, um, perhaps intimidation uh, to prevent board members from um, commenting based on the consequences uh, when there is a <clears throat> really no clarification of the process of how that would happen. So I, I would like uh, the First Amendment rights to be considered and I'd like to ask Ms. Howie um, how that would uh, be handled in this from a policy analysis and uh, a policy amendment. Point, point I'm sorry, view. point of order, though, we have a motion and that we need to vote on. It sounds like you're wanting to speak about something else, um, but we need to vote on the well, motion. No, I'm, I'm That's... asking it because I want to understand from um, Ms. Howie how that would be handled, whether uh, I would support this motion for a, an ad hoc work group. How the First Amendment in the Constitution would be handled as it relates to a social media policy? Is that your question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Does that in any way relate to this policy? Because I think we need to move on because this is now spiraling out of control. It absolutely relates to this policy. I was asking um, Ms. Howie. So, so members of the board, if the question as I understand it is whether or not the First Amendment rights of uh, members of the Board of Education are in some way curtailed, that is not directly addressed in the policy analysis. If that is something that members of the board wish addressed, that is something that can be researched that is not directly addressed currently. Thank you. I think we need to take a vote. Did you have Thank something you to say or are we finished? Nope. Ladies, okay. Then, Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please, to the motion on the no, floor, and I'll repeat it because there's been question. quite some time. We're, we're moving on. We need to vote. We are already um, over time. The board establishes. Ms. Hen moved to have the board establish an ad hoc committee to review time. policy 8601 and related policies in order to make recommendations to the board. It was seconded by Ms. Mack. Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please, starting with Ms. Ms. Rowe? Excuse me, Madam Chair. Point yes. of order. Other board okay, we're in the middle of a vote. Ms. Rowe? Ms. Causey? No, we're not in the middle of a vote. Okay, Ms. Mack? I'm calling a point of order because I... We're already in the middle of a vote. Ms. Mack? Yes. And I, I would um, appreciate... Mr. McMillian? Receiving the same... The, receiving the same... Mr. McMillian? Board member. Ms. Jose? Yes, I'm here. I'm no. here. What can, what, I'm no. Here. No, okay. Point of order. Go of ahead. Um, after Ms. Joe Smith, Hen. Did Mr. McMillian get the vote? Oh, Mr. Yeah, McMillian. Vote. Yes, we're taking a vote on the establishment of the ad hoc committee. Mr. McMillian, yeah. I have called the point. Mr. Of order McMillian said I'm yes. Okay. My, my apologies, Madam Chair. The, uh, the the point of order can interrupt the vote. The point of order can interrupt the vote. Yes. Okay. You've called a point of order based on what? Um. Parliamentary procedures. And what is the point of order you're raising? Where I had two minutes to address this motion, and other board members were allowed to make all their comments, ask their questions, and I was not okay, allowed to. Okay, by do all so. means, please I'm go ahead, Ms. Causey. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the Office of uh, Inspector General for Education also pointed out in the letter that there uh, should be updates to the board handbook. And it was also pointed out Ms. Howie's um, additional addendums for this policy um, that details could be done in the board handbook. So I have not been on the ad hoc board handbook committee since January. So I'd like to understand what uh, process is in place for that ad hoc board handbook revision committee to do its work where this might also be done. That's my question. Okay, yes, Ms. Joseph, you can answer that. I'd like to point out the sequence of events. In 2019, the ad hoc committee was formed, so the board members are aware, with Ms. Hen as the chair, um, and I was the vice chair, and Ms. Pasteur was in that committee. A few months later, Ms. Hen left the committee. I moved on as chair. Ms. Causey came in and became vice chair of the committee, and Ms. Pasture, we had the pandemic, and we tried to work to the pandemic. We've had several iterations go back and forth to get the handbook. And also, members need to know, the handbook is just a guide. It's always superseded by policy. Policy supersedes our handbook. The handbook has not been approved. We had Ms. Causey then leave the committee um, this January, 
And so since then, it's been Ms. Pastor, me, and Ms. Go, we're having working through it. And, and this is what I'm talking about, the dysfunctionality of forming ad hoc committees where people come in and out. It's not an open door. We have an established standing committee, the PRC, that should be doing that work. Forming one more layer of bureaucracy is just going to postpone the formation of this. Uh, for some reason, there is a lot of resistance, and nobody is talking about uh, intimidation. If you're talking about intimidation, I have been intimidated by people that have filed a complaint against me for simply speaking on this board, and you know who you are. That is infringing upon my First Amendment rights, that I did not have a right to speak. So do not talk about intimidation, infringement of First Amendment rights until you've experienced it as a person of color. All right? So I'm done with my soapbox, and thank you. Okay. Any more comments, questions? We're still in the vote. I, I don't know what we're, yeah, we're, st we're still in the vote. Ms. Causey caused a point of order because she had a question about the handbook, which was answered. So can we take a vote now? This, this would be the appropriate time to take the vote. The point okay. of order has been Okay, because I keep getting interrupted every time I try to take a vote. So, <laughs> okay. Ms. Gover, can we take a vote, please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Yes. Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? No. Ms. Hans? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasteur? No. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Hughes? Yes. Paper is six. I, I haven't voted yet. I'm <laughs> I've been talking the whole time. <laughs> no. <laughs> so it's split right down the middle. Okay, so um, what does that mean if it's split down the middle? It fails? All right. So that motion fails. Okay, so then are there questions then? I, excuse me. Oh, sorry, so now we're just still discussing, because um, it was separated out, policy 8601. So I, I know there were some questions, and I apologize, I thought I had the order, um, but I, I believe it was uh, Dr. Hager, Ms. Ms. Rowe, and then Mr. Thomas. Okay, sorry. Dr. I was just going to ask if we should revisit what I was talking about at the beginning about changing that language at the end, but I, I'll let Ms. Rowe and Mr. Thomas ask their questions first. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Um, I move to delete section E, section three. Yes, yeah, so section two E and all of section three. Second. Okay, so you move to, could you repeat it again because I want to make sure I have it correct. I move to delete section 2E and all of section 3. Okay, and that was seconded by Ms. Hen. Okay, is there any discussion on that? Removing, oh, sorry, I need to repeat it. Um, Ms. Rowe moved to um, remove section 2E and all of section E? Three. Excuse me, all of section three. And that was seconded by Ms. Hen. Mm -hmm. Can I okay. speak to the motion? Yes, may I speak to your motion. So in reading through this policy, I can get on board with everything the way it's currently worded, except for section 2E and all of section three. Um, we could do more editing, but I think that's the simplest edit that would allow me to vote for this policy. Okay. All right. And any questions on the motion at hand? <coughs> Mr. Offerman. About a question, but I think removal of, uh, of uh, three would take the teeth out of this. Mm -hmm. And in fact, would, would, would make it pointless, even, even, even to have the motion. Just my opinion, thank you. Okay, thank you. And then who, uh, Dr. Hager, to the motion, yes. Just a logistics question, since this is first reader, if we, may, if we pass this motion and it goes, it goes back to PRC, is that correct? Or is that it? Then no, it, it comes up 
Oh, actually, if Ms. Um, Howie would like to speak to it, because then it goes to second reading. If the board and first reader amends the policy, then the policy will be returned to you, second reader, as amended. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yep. Mr. Thomas? I'm sorry. I thought you had a question towards the motion. Oh, uh, I if have a comment. Not, that's fine. I'll make a comment. Oh, sure. Certainly. Yeah, so uh, I, I don't think, I, like what Mr. Offerman said about this removing the purpose of the policy, I completely agree. Removing the violations, it, it just kind of, it, it doesn't have any consequences to board action. And I think that's the purpose of this, is to have consequences to board action on social media. Because when we talk about infringing on the rights and, and free speech in the board, you have a spot in this boardroom to hold each other accountable, to hold members accountable. And on social media, it's my belief that that should be used as a source of education to share resources about what the board is doing or to engage community members, not to discuss policy, not really to uh, go out and, 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 and target other board members. It's a space for you to engage with the community. And I think that here in this boardroom is a place to talk about um, the actual policy and to do the work of the board. And so uh, I think, <laughs> I, I think that the policy should go forward as it's stated initially. Any other questions towards the motion on the floor? Okay, to remove sections 2E and all of section 3. Okay, um, Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please, on the motion made by Ms. Rowe and seconded by Ms. Hen. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Yes. Yes. Williams? Mr. McMillian? No. No. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Mr. No, wait a minute. <laughs> Ms. Jones? No. Ms. Penn? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Austin? No. Dr. Hager? No. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Hughes? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. So it fails. Can I make one more try? <laughs> Again, right <laughs> down the middle, so <laughs> it does not pass. So, um, again, back to 8601, I had a question from, it looked like from you, Mr. Thomas, just no? Not anymore. I just not anymore? Said what I had okay. To say, yeah. Um, and then Dr. Hager? I'm going to make one more try. Okay. okay. I, I think hopefully this will stick. <laughs> so if I, I'd like to make a motion to remove 2E and all of part three, but add in the addendum that was listed by Ms. Howie, which says the board as a whole has the authority to decide whether this policy has been violated and whether censure or any other mode of discipline should be imposed. Comment on that? Second. Well, is there a second? Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. second. second. Okay, so was, uh, the motion was by Dr. Hager to remove 2E and all of section three and add the addendum from Ms. Howie. And that was seconded by Ms. Rowe. Okay. All right, and um, discussion around that. Any questions, um, Mr. Offerman? I would like to hear the addendum again. Oh, okay. I can read it out loud slow, more slowly. Yes, that would want. be great. Thanks. I just have it up on my computer. Um, it reads, the board as a whole has the authority to decide whether this policy has been violated and whether censure or any other mode of discipline should be imposed. It's, it's on board docs as an addendum. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Did you have another question, Mr. Offerman? Or? No. No? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, Ms. Jose? Are you also removing, um, Ms. Dr. Hager, 2E, which is board members should always conduct themselves, is that being removed as well? Mm-hmm. Yes. But there's a very important part in there that says board members should only post content that the school system and the school board have already released to the public. And that is critical because sometimes, and Dr. Williams can probably speak on it, there is confidential stuff that should not be decimated. Um, privileged information and so that is important to keep that tag so if you would be willing to amend that to board members sh uh, should only post content that the school system the school board have already released to the public and then take off the first half I would be willing to vote on that then um, 
May, can I respond to that? Is that appropriate? Yes. Um, my concern is also the vagueness of the language. When I read it, it, it's funny because the way you interpreted it was different than the way I interpreted it. I was I interpreted it as we're only allowed to like repost things that the board that the school uh, system has posted, as opposed to only sharing things that have been kind of approved and aren't secret or something. Um, so I feel that the language, the way it's written, is is vague, just given that we both interpreted it differently. So, um, um, Dr. Ms. Um, Howie, if you could step in. The way I interpret it is that we should not disseminate anything that is confidential, privileged, until the superintendent of the school system approves it, because we get a lot of information on a daily basis, do not disseminate, disseminate and uh, board members could post that, and sometimes it could be information that could be um, privileged. So that's, what's my, that's how I interpreted it. And Ms. Howie, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Thank you. Okay. So I believe the same question was raised by Ms. Mack, and there is a response in the addendum, that, and because Ms. Mack's comment, as I recall, was that she often posts on her social media information or data that she has received from other agencies. That is not privileged data. It's been released. Exactly. It's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be data or information that is released by the school system. Okay, and I want to make sure I get everybody. I have the order of Kuhn, Hen, Mac, and Rowe. No, no Mac. Okay. Just, okay, Mr. Kuhn. Just and, and Ms. Causey. Please. And Causey. Okay. Uh, to to um, address Ms. Joe's comment, I thought part under under two standard C. It talks about board members shall not disseminate content generated by the board or the school system that the board and the school system is not already released to the public or information considered confidential by law or confidential information discussed. So it covers what you're talking about. I believe that was what you were talking about. Is that, is that true? Can't hear you. <laughs> yes, that's what I was talking about. But also, it's kind of reiterating that sometimes there is um, privileged confidential information that may not be. But if, if the PRC chair is okay with that language, then I'm fine mm -hmm. with it. But I do think that needs to be stated. That yeah, I, I just believe it's covered. That's what my my only point. By by taking away E, it doesn't impact C. It's still there. And outside of this policy, we're not allowed to share anything within administrative or closed session regardless and actually could be taken against us as members. Just everybody remembers that and knows that, so thank you. Okay, Ms. Hen. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Kuhn, for pointing that out because I was actually going to offer similar language. I didn't, that was a good catch for C because I think it is covered, um, the type of content that Ms. Joes brought up, and I would accept that. Um, as an amendment to E, but I, I agree with Mr. Kuhn that C covers information that is generated by the school system or is owned by the school system that is not already in the public domain or that it's data that's um, otherwise publicly available. So I'm comfortable with that um, if you are. So thank you, Mr. Kuhn. And Ms. Rowe? So when I um, read section E and it gets to that part about and she'll post only content that the school system and the school board have already released to the public, I took that to mean the only thing I'm, I'd be allowed to post is something that's already been written and proved by the school system, which would limit creation of my own opinions on education matters in the school system, sharing of articles of other people's opinions, sharing anything that is an opinion that's different from the approved messaging of the school system. And so, you know, that, that whole section E, there's really nothing in it that I can support the way that it's worded now. And I can't think in the limited time frame of this meeting of a wording that I would like. So I think deleting it is the best way to move this policy forward. Ms. Causey? Thank you. Um, I also am concerned about uh, <clears throat> the um, restricting the content since there's a, a number of sources that have reliable information as was pointed out by um, 
um, Ms. Howie about another board member with MSDE and other um, other government agencies. Um, also, in reviewing this, there is no distinction uh, between a board member's personal page and uh, a page that they use for uh, community engagement. So. Uh, I think the wording needs to be improved for that. Um, and I don't know if Dr. Hager would want to um, amend, you know, think about that and amend her statement. But I want to ask Ms. Howie, is there anything in this policy that you think clearly delineates the difference between a board member's personal page and um, a page that they use uh, strictly for community engagement and um, providing information regarding uh, educational issues. Yes, you may. Yeah. Thank you. So, Ms. Causey, I suppose I'm not clear as to what you would consider a personal page. If a board member has established a social media account as a school board member, in order to inform the public uh, about uh, the board members' uh, position on issues, what is going on in the school system, then it's not clear to me what you mean by a personal page. If by a personal page uh, there is information that is unrelated to your board service, then uh, in effect, as you're communicating, you're not communicating as a school board member solely, but as a private citizen, although the bifurcation is sometimes difficult for people to see. So I, I am not quite clear what you mean by a personal page. Madam Chair, can I explain that for Ms. Howie? Um, you want to explain it to Ms. Howie? Yeah, so in I think Ms. Howie knows what a personal page is and a board page. She said she didn't. I'm just trying to explain. She doesn't understand what... She just okay. said she didn't. Um, uh, no, no. This is... I believe, if I could just summarize, um, as I understand what Ms. Calzy is saying is, is there's nothing in here, um, she says, that directly delineates between, like, if you have a personal page that you post maybe about cats and dogs and a board page. But... This is only addressing the board page. We're not addressing what you do on your personal time and your personal page. So if it's a personal page, then you wouldn't be posting um, as a board member or anything about the board. So um, I guess the question for you, Ms. Howie, would be is, is that relevant? Is that something relevant that we should add then to this policy? So this is the board's policy? Mm -hmm. And if the board believes that it's unclear as to which speech is being addressed, then it is fully appropriate for the board to indicate and to amend the policy to indicate that the conduct that is being addressed is conduct that takes place on a board member's page as a board member. The caution that I would ask the board to make sure that the board discusses, and I do not think that members of the board would do this, is that you do not use a personal page to express opinions and get around the board's own standards of conduct by saying, well, I put this on my personal page about how much I hate dogs. I did not put this on my board member page. Therefore, it has nothing to do with my service as a board member. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that if the board, um, and again, I, I do not think that members of the board would would take such um, such an action, but that is something that you want to make sure you discuss in this forum. This is your policy. Mm -hmm. This is your internal policy. So you are the best individuals to discuss and determine exactly how you want to regulate your own behavior. Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you for that, Howie. Oh, thank you. I, I 
concur with Ms. Howie. I think a violation of the policy wherever it occurs is a violation of the policy. If we say that we don't want confidential information posted, it really doesn't matter where it's posted. If it's on your board page or your personal page, it's still as an, an egregious a violation. So I don't think, I think we would judge it so, the same. So I don't think that delineation, while on the surface, and I understand what Ms. Causey is saying, I think that violations would be judged similarly no matter where they occur. And I think these are the standards of conduct that we would want to uphold as board members no matter where we are, you know, the behavior occurs online. I am routinely uncivil. I mm -hmm. said my brother on social media. Am I going to be dinged for that because it's on my personal page? Because, look, people are very candid on their personal profile and only their friends can see it. So I don't feel like I have to behave in a professional way on my personal profile because only my friends and the people I want to see those posts can see it. So if I decide to, uh, you know, make fun of what my brother wore that day, thus that would be considered unprofessional on my board page, but I'm on my personal page. So I do think there needs to be some delineation between, you know, because I have no problem with the language that says I have to maintain decorum at all times, but I'm not expected to maintain decorum in my living room or when I'm out for coffee with my friends. So I don't think I have to maintain decorum on my personal profile that only my friends can see. Okay. Ms. Um, Pastor, did you have a question? No, just to say that we're talking Can't about we're talking about board business here. We're not talking about what how any of us talk to anyone else. We're talking about board business. That as Ms. Hen said, whether you're on your personal page or your professional page, if you're talking about board business that is in some way embargoed or confidential, it's inappropriate. It is just wrong. So what you do on your your page, as you said, only some people can see it go forth into the world. But we're talking about board business. And so I would just say I don't really have, sorry, um, I don't really have an issue with um, Dr. Hager's motion um, adding the addendum, um, uh, removing item three, because it does say um, further up um, as far as um, board members conducting themselves uh, and having uh, decorum. It, it did mention that um, should maintain civility and decorum at all times, including when interacting online. And I don't, I don't think that's asking too much. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to well, amend well, hold on. the motion on the floor. There's a motion on the floor. Sorry, we couldn't hear. Um, uh, um, and also, um, Ms. Mack was already, um, had already asked a question. Uh, she asked me to restate the motion. And Dr. Hager said um, she made a motion to remove item 2E and all of three and to add the addendum. And I can read, yes. and then it was seconded by Thank you. Ms. Rowe. And um, the addendum was, or is, the board as a whole has the authority to decide whether this policy has been violated and whether censure or any other mode of discipline should be imposed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to make a motion to amend the motion on the floor to include the language at line 26 so that it states, when posting items on social media as a board member, comma. I'm sorry, did you go out, Ms. Causey? Uh, no, she did. Ms. Causey, uh, Ms. Causey are you still there? She's amending something yes, the motion is deleting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I, Wait. The, where? You said line, just to make sure that we're all clear, you said line 26, Ms. Causey, which line did you say? On page one. So, Ms. Causey, your motion to amend has to amend the amendment. Your, your motion to amend as a secondary amendment has to address the amendment itself, not the, not the main language. So, if you want to amend the amendment, you're able to do that uh, by changing those words, but adding other words that are not in the amendment would not be a proper motion. Okay, so if I want to make an amendment to the motion on the floor, 
Would you like me to read it again? Also, amend page one, line 26, after when posting items on social media add, as a board member. And that would be a proper motion in and of itself as a standalone motion. But there is an amendment on the floor. You can, an, you can amend an amendment, but you have to amend the amendment. You can't amend by adding something that is not within the motion itself. Okay, then I'll strike that. I'll just do it next. Thank you. Thank you. Would you all like me to repeat it again, or are we ready for the vote? Oh, you would like me to repeat it? <laughs> okay. We're voting on the amendment for 8601. So that's the policy that was pulled out, and um, we're voting to pass it from first reader, and Dr. Hager has made an amendment to the motion, which is what I'm about to read, to remove item 2E and all of three and add the addendum to the, um, to the policy. And it was seconded by Ms. Rell. And the addendum was what I, was, what I had read before, and I'll read it again. The board as a whole has the authority to decide whether this policy has been violated and whether censure or any other mode of discipline should be imposed. So that's what we, we would be voting on. If you um, agree with the amendment, you vote yes. If you disagree with the amendment, you vote no. So are we ready to take a vote? OK, great. Ms. Gover? Oh, she's talking. Ms. Gover, we're ready to vote on the amendment. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Penn? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offer? Yes. Ms. Hester? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so that amendment, the motion passes. Okay, so now. So that was the amendment. So now we have the motion. Madam Chair. Yeah, oh, yes, sorry. Yes, approve the motion as amended, right? The policy as amended. Okay, so next, um, do Madam, I have a motion Madam to approve? Chair, oh, yes. So are we going to allow Ms. Causey to make her motion about line 26? Did she want to? I didn't hear her say that she withdrew it. She did. I thought she said she wanted to make it after this motion because Ms. Howie said it was a standalone. All right, Ms. Causey, you're speaking on her behalf? I okay. thought I heard her trying Chair. to speak. All right. <laughs> thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Causey, could you speak a little louder? We are having some trouble hearing you. Certainly. Is that better? Yes. yes. Thank you. I would like to amend the motion to approve the policy as amended to include on page one, line 26. The Ms. Causey, you're not amending a motion. A you're making a new motion. You're not amending a motion. It's a, a new motion. So you, you would just... I thought the original motion on the floor was to approve this policy, and then uh, Ms., um, excuse me, Dr. Hager amended this, the yes. motion on the floor. So that amendment passed. So now you're starting a new, as, as um, Ms. Howie was saying, you're starting a new motion on the policy. So your motion, you said, is related to line 26. So yes, if you could clearly repeat it so that I can restate it. And loudly. <laughs> yes. I move to add on line 26 of page 1 so that the first sentence reads, when posting items on social media as a board member. That's part 1. The Second. other part is to add she, as she a finished. legal reference 
the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Ms. Cosby, you may have to email that over to me. Um, I, I can't properly restate that. That sounds like a very complex motion at 9 o'clock at night, and I can barely hear you. And um, I think this is very much important that I want to make sure I properly state the motion. Certainly. If there's a other conversation, I had started to type it to email it, so I'll do that. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So I will check my email. You, you, could you send that over to um, uh, as well include Tracy and, and Ms. Hen as well? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Did you have a question? I was just wondering how it was going to be added to the motion, like to the policy. I was confused, but if she's sending it to you, then, okay. then that should yes. clarify it. Yes, I just um, so when we have complex motions like that that are multi-layered, um, it's important to state them properly. So, Madam Chair, are we are we doing that? Is that how we're doing complicated motions now? Is emailing them in the board meeting to the chair? Um, I had asked for that before, but um, no one seemed like to do that. Like during the meeting, because we're not using chat? Is that what we're doing now? Yes, or filling out a form filling if you know out. you have a motion coming so like up and this. passing okay. it over. Yeah. All right. Um, because there's no way for me to properly state that. I understand. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Because the last thing we would want to have is a misunderstanding. Ms. Cossie, in the interest of time, um, do you think you could do it at second reader? Would that be agreeable? Um, I think uh, I'm just about to hit it. If anyone has questions for me around this, I'm happy to answer that. I don't think we're quite clear on exactly what the motion is to ask questions. So. Could we maybe just do the motion with the language change around line 26? Because that I understand. The second thing she said, I didn't even understand what she said. But she was doing so it as one it. motion. Okay. So I sent it, and here's what it says. Yeah. <clears throat> to page one, line 26, add the words so that the first sentence reads, when posting items on social media as a board member. A board member must clarify, and then it goes on. And to add the legal references, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. And you want this added on line 26? No, legal references is at the end. It's at where? Uh, at the end of the policy, on this oh, 36. document, it's on page two. Okay. So it's two parts. You want something added to line 26 and to line 36? Well, it, the legal references can be added wherever it fits in that segment when staff brings it back. Okay. Okay, so um, I can restate Ms. Causey's motions in, in the interest of time because we, we. Did you say that? Yeah, as a board member and then the other. It's two parts. Okay, so what Ms. Causey would like to do is, um, is her she made a motion to page one, line twenty six, to add the words so that the first sentence reads: "When posting items on social media as a board member," and then to add the legal references first amendment of the united states constitution at the end which is line 36 so that's her motion is there a second second row there's a second from miss row okay um and if we could do a oh, okay if if we could do a roll call vote please so that we can um move along from this policy um miss gover please 
Yes. Ms. Causey is a yes. 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 No. Yes. No. No. <laughs> um, no. Yes. No. <laughs> yes. No. Okay, so that language um, is added to the um, to the policy. So now, if we could, <laughs> um, do I have a motion um, to move? Um, do you have a motion to accept and to move policy 8601 and advance it to second reader? So moved, moved. Offerman. Is there a second? Second, Thomas. <laughs> okay. Um, Ms. Gover, may we have a roll call vote, please, on policy 8601? Yes, as amended. Excuse me, as amended. Yes, thank you. Yes. Mr. McMillian? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Thank you. So policy 8601 moves on to second reader. And then now we have policy 5210 that was also pulled out. No. Yes. It was pulled out, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any discussion on yes. 52, excuse me, 5210? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. excuse me, Ms. Mack, yes. Yes. Um, yes. Yes, I yes. have significant concern. Yes. I believe that 5201 yes. Yes. Five two one zero. Is somebody talking? Thank you. So policy eight six zero. No, I think it's the feedback um, from our um, board members on the phone. If you could mute. Okay. Sorry, Ms. Matt. In 2016, there were significant changes made to the grading policy, um, and it's, I don't know if it's a coincidence or not. At that period of time, we had a precipitous drop in our academic achievement. And I believe that the policy needs to be gone through for a cause and effect of the changes that were made to see if those changes contributed to the precipitous drop in academic outcomes and that none of that is addressed as this policy is written today. So I would like further review of the 2016 changes and their impact on outcomes and whether or not those changes that were made in 2016 need to be rescinded or changed in any way. Okay, any other discussion? Yes, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Um, on section three standards uh, D, it says to ensure educational equity, an equity lens shall be required for the implementation of grading procedures. Can someone explain what this means when it comes to grading? I don't understand how grading would be modified um, based on an equity lens. And we have Ms. Megan Shea who has joined us. <laughs> Ms. Shea and Dr. Boswell McComas, did you all hear the question and can you provide a response? Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank good you, evening. Definitely. Thank you. Yes, I did hear the question. I'd be happy to explain. So when we talk about applying racial equity lens, we often use focus questions. So the questions that we use are such as, who are the student groups being impacted by this decision? Does this decision ignore existing disparities or in some cases expand them? Have I obtained alternative perspectives? Have I worked to remove barriers? And if I can't remove barriers, how can I mitigate them? An example in grading, if that would help, is homework. So there was a lot of conversation in the revisions about whether or not, excuse me, <coughs> homework should be graded. 
if I think about the student groups most likely to be impacted by homework being graded, I think about our English learners who don't have parents at home that might speak English and can support them. I think about students who don't have access to reliable internet or electricity. I think about students who are receiving special education supports and may not have access to those. And so using an equity lens, I would center those groups in making the decision. Okay, that's, that's fine, I guess. But I'm, I'm looking here and homework, for example, is part of the body of evidence. So what exactly are you saying? Are you saying as a teacher that is trying to grade a student that if I believe the case is that they're at a disadvantage doing homework at home, that I'm going to not pay attention to the homework and grade that, but I'll grade everything else? Potentially, yeah. So when making a decision about whether or not a homework assignment should be graded, for example, because it's not completely eliminated, as you know, in the policy, but I would determine that question I mentioned about if I can't remove barriers, what have I done to mitigate them? So if I had a student who I knew did not have those supports and I wanted the homework to be graded as a teacher, what am I doing to mitigate those barriers? How am I providing time and support for students if I'm going to assign it a grade to make sure I'm using an equity lens? Okay, because part of what I thought I heard you say, you were talking about content, content meaning curriculum. Like, did I, the questions that I'm asking and the, the sources and stuff that I'm using, are they appropriate for different people? Yeah. Or the, is that, did I miss that? Because that's what I heard when you started talking. No, I'm saying that when we talk about applying an equity lens, you asked about that language yes. in the policy. When we talk about applying an equity lens, the questions that I described are what we mean by applying an equity lens. Those general questions apply to decision making including things like policy and rule and how they're going to be implemented and how they'll impact different groups of students. Okay, I think I'll follow it. Thank you. All right, Dr. Hager and then Ms. Pastor. Just a quick follow-up question. This policy, though, is supposed to be uniform across the school system. So just um, in the example, it made it sound like an individual teacher for an individual student could make a decision grading differentially by student, but this is really implying an equity lens to how we grade as a system. Just is Right, so in right. our grading procedures manual, we talk about what decisions are made at the system level, school level, and the teacher level. So there are some instances where that might be at the teacher level or at the department or grade level, school level, or system level, and that's outlined in the procedures manual. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Next, Ms. Pastor. It just, um, Clarification, and maybe I, I just misheard it, but when the question was asked related to homework, I thought I heard, so if the student doesn't have the necessary, let's say, accoutrements at home, then they would not do that assignment. That's not what is meant. They will do the assignment. The teacher will just know that there is another means, another way, another vehicle to have that same body of work done to accommodate that student through that equity lens. Is that correct? Correct. So we're talking specifically about grading. So when you, your question about how would an equity lens be applied to grading, that's the consideration that would be done to think about when I center the students who need me to really be thinking about them because they have these additional barriers, how can I, when applying grading, think about mitigating that impact? We don't lower standards of teaching. We don't change assignments. We provide the necessary scaffolds. But when we're talking about grading, if I use my own personal children as an example, it might be done at home, but they have me for support. They have two parents that speak English as a first language that have access to resources. Providing the, my child with the same grading expectations as a student who doesn't have those things is not using an equity lens when it comes to grading. And just to finish on my question, that I, I really needed you to clarify that because no one should think, anyone, anywhere, that we're saying whatever the situation is that we're exonerating or making an exception because that's not an equity lens. Correct. That's quite the opposite Correct. because now you're not giving, doing justice and offering that child equity to just let them go by the wayside. And, and I don't want this to only be about homework. So, I was just so trying to let use me, an example. Let me just interject. Thank you. Sure. Uh, appreciate that, Ms. Shea and, and Ms. Pastor. You just said it. There's a difference between equity and equ equity and equality. Right. And so I'd love how you framed their decisions, system level, 
department level classroom teacher, and it gets back to my statement, every student should have at least one adult in the building whom they trust to advocate. So if little Daryl doesn't do his homework, there's something little Daryl will do that next day in class to make sure little Daryl, I don't know why I always use little Daryl as an example, <laughs> but so little Daryl understands the concept. Little Daryl was not that way in school, so let me just put that out there. But I'm just, I'm just, wanna, just want to say there's the, there's the role of the classroom teacher, the professional, trained, to make sure they're meeting the needs of the students. There's the PLC where they come together and talk as content grade level folks to talk about what students are mastering and what they're not and what are we going to do differently. But sometimes, and I heard it uh, periodically, equity and equality are not the same. And Dr. Yarbrough is not here, but we have another visual for the system just to remind. If you recall the visual of the students on the soapbox, you know, looking at the game, you know, one might need a, might not need the soapbox, one might need a short soapbox, one might need a big soapbox. We want to make sure that we are applying an equity lens. So if there may be a, a different way in which another student may need to do the assignment. Um, so I, I appreciate those responses, and I appreciate how you kind of layered it at the different level policy implementation school department and classroom teacher and the professionals are within those classrooms thank you thank you and um miss colsey has a question miss colsey thank you. thank you madam chair the um to miss uh max point about the um evaluation so Early in policy review, there were some. There was a meeting in the fall um, where board members just spoke to uh, concerns and comments and suggestions in general um, that were um, to be considered when the policy came up for review. Um, one of the issues at that time was the evaluation of the impact of the implementation, because of course policy. Uh, is one thing and then the implementation is another and there can be processes that are logical and thought out um, but just not implemented <clears throat> as effectively in, in all areas. Um, and so policy 10 is under evaluation um, and I, I think it is important before the board um, moves this forward that the full board hear that evaluation that has been done. Um, that is a question that I did send in um, in July when these policies were um, originally supposed to come to first reader. Um, the other issue is in the discussion of policy 5210 is the um, issue around attendance and the impact that the attendance has. And I had sent an email to the um, superintendent and the full board um, related to um, the policies that were pointed out in the policy analysis and i do want to thank staff for the additional poli policy analysis that was done um, on on some of these policies um, so i think the board should really consider before this is moved forward the impact of the evaluation i had requested uh, dr williams how close is that evaluation uh to being done was a question it's time I sent in. thank you Dr. Williams, um, Ms. Causey, I didn't know if you had the answer for that this evening, like the amount of time um, for, uh, she said, a presentation to be completed. I, I don't have an answer. I, I'm just looking at the policy, mm -hmm. and it sounds like there's a question around the implementation of the policy. And so I can't respond to that. This is a policy setting how to govern as Ms. Shea, I think it was Ms. Shea, referenced the grading and reporting manual. Um, so I, I'm, I need some clarity when I hear evaluation. I need clarity when I hear cause and effect about something that was done mm -hmm. back in 2015, 2016. And we have been under circumstances for the last year. I, I, I just wonder if that's where the board, full board really wants us to go. This is a policy. Every system has a policy. How it's being implemented, 
during these circumstances is just a question that I have. I'm not sure how we would evaluate what rubric would we use, um, the cause and effect based on what cohorts of students. Uh, it, it feels for me right now, not knowing exactly the, what the request was, a major project. Um, so I have so questions, so I can't you. answer that. Thank yeah. you, Ms. All right, well, thank you okay. for that. So, so she, we can, um, perhaps maybe you could follow up with Ms. Causey or, or, or okay. something. No, All right, Ms. Um, Rowe had a question. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse no, me. Ms. Causey, your, your time was up. Your, your time was up. And we have some other board members Dr. who have Williams questions. Question, no, I he didn't ask the question. He said he question. was unable to um, respond at this time, but that he would um, follow up. So, Ms. Rose has been waiting well, patiently. So, Ms. Causey, like, excuse me. Your time was up, Ms. Causey. Oh, okay. Ms. Rowe, who've been waiting, who has been waiting patiently, please go ahead with your question. So, I heard what you. Um, said to Mr. Kuhn, and I need a clarification on something because it has recently come to my attention that my high school child pays extremely close attention to her grades and other things. So if you have two children taking the same course in the same class by the same teacher, and the course grades, let's say there's 11 graded assignments, does each student have 11 graded assignments, or are you saying that some students could have fewer graded assignments than other students? Right, so I'll go ahead, Ms. Shea, and then you can certainly jump in, as you, I know you've worked uh, closely with the committee. So what we're saying, uh, Ms. Rowe, is that ideally every student's gonna have those same number of assignments. Mm -hmm. If there's a student who is disadvantaged, as some of the examples that we spoke to tonight, as a teacher, I need to be aware of what are those disadvantages that a student may be working uh, against, if you will, to accomplish everything. And then I, as a teacher, need to mitigate how do I support that student? So is it that perhaps I extend their time? Perhaps I make sure that they come to tutoring Right, so we, we try to build those supports or scaffolds to support every student in completing those same expectations because the expectations are um, in alignment with the standard, right? And so part of our, our intention around our grading is that we are assessing how students are performing, what they know and can do against the Maryland College and Career Ready standards, right? And we know that we collect a body of evidence. And so that body of evidence will, will have like major assignments. It may have 11 assignments in the example that you raised. And so I as a teacher need to make sure that all the elements that need to be demonstrated against the standards, I can see that our students know and can do that and that can be accomplished in a couple different ways. And if there's a particular assignment or um, piece of the body of evidence that a student needs support on because they're working against some disadvantage in some way, then I need to work with that student to help them um, to complete that. So the idea isn't that we have Swiss cheese, right, and that some mm -hmm. people do more and others do less. The idea is that those who are facing disadvantages we work to support, as Dr. Williams used the example of the um, box, I would be one of the short kids who needs two boxes to see over the, the fence, but that's the example. Listen, I was a kid who was carrying my boxes with me, so you don't need right. to, <laughs> but I guess, I guess my point in this question is, mm -hmm. the kids seem to get very hung up on like their class rank, mm -hmm. and if you have, students with mathematical different numbers of assignments then you know that's something students might like to know because like you know my daughter loses sleep at night in a course that only has three assignments right. if the kid sitting next to her has 10 they could easily get a much higher gpa than her and she has three if she just messes up one so i guess what i'm looking at is our two kids sitting in the same class with the same teacher have comparative mathematical expectations that make up their mathematical grade so that like if one kid needs more opportunities to do the same assignment fine but what i'm saying is do you understand what i'm saying i do go ahead miss shea um i do and so when we talk about a body of evidence i think you used a word there that's really helpful it's comparative so teachers um if dr mccombs and i were in the same class 
our body of evidence may not be identical because there's small group instruction and there's different opportunities but it should be commensurate. Teachers have to use, so we do provide guidance to teachers in the procedures manual and in the training about the balance, the estimated number of assignments, that's all part of the curriculum recommendations. And so there is a standardization, if you will, in terms of what should be in a body of evidence, the relative weight of different categories. And when I mentioned before that there are decisions at the um, course or team level or school level, it's designed to have that equitable situation. So there should not be an instance where Mary has three grades and I have 14, because you're right, the relative impact of one of those assignments would be significantly different. Mm -hmm. But if we both had, if I had 14 and Mary had 15, they may not be identical because mine might reflect the work I'm doing in a small group or some other project. That's what we were referencing. So there is some guidance provided around having that opportunity at the grade department or school level, as we mentioned before, as well as the distribution of those categories in terms of minor and major. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. And it looks like we have a question from Mr. Offerman. Uh, yes, uh, th these two areas, homework and, uh, and uh, attendance, I focused on this about a year ago, and I've talked to both Dr. McComas and, and, and Ms. Shea at length. Uh, I think, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to quote you, Michelle, but I'm going to try to relay what what I uh, what I believe you said. There is there was some part filling among the committee, and I'd like you to explain who, if you could, to the board who who's on the committee, because I was quite impressed that that it encompassed, you know, a, a, a wide range of people who were involved in this situation. Uh, I, I would think that it was, uh, you know, that that that, uh, that 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 the committee was was looking at perhaps the things that were instituted in 2016 may have gone to one extreme, okay, and not and not of course not not on purpose, right. but 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 perhaps we needed to to relook at those things. My concern, more than the homework, was the attendance, mm -hmm. and it, I know the attendance impacts grades, but more important, it I, I believe it, it, it sets up patterns and when these students leave here whether they go to college or they go to the workforce or the military attendance above all else at least from my perspective and I've worked in the private sector too as well as teaching I mean that's the absolute critical piece if you're not there and you don't come to work or you're not on time you, I think your chances of success are, are, are pretty much any, even if you're working from home so uh, you know I, 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 I feel comfortable with the things that uh, Ms. Shea was saying to me at that point because I think people are looking at it, and it's not unusual after a shift is made like this to, 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 to maybe, to maybe re-examine it and go back and see, have we gone too far, or can we make a better choice that will, that will benefit more people to work ways? So, uh, uh, and, and none of this is in the policy, per se. This is in the superintendent's rule or the, uh, the manual to work from. And I don't want to overstate our, our impact because, because we are not supposed Hi. to be we're not supposed to be doing that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, next is Mr. Thomas and then Dr. Hager. Yes, thank you. I have a comment. Um, I think that when we were talking about class rank and, and GPA, uh, that's only applying to a, a certain amount of students who are actually caring about their class rank and GPA. A small select high school students who are thinking about college competitive schools. There are so many other kids in our county that are just focusing on their education and having educational supports is needed for them. So I think we're talking about this grading policy as if grading is the only way to measure a student's success in school. That is not the only way to measure a student's success. In fact, I think that's one of the worst ways to, effect, to a measure a student's success because it doesn't actually measure what it is that we're learning and our independent ways of thought. Instead, it's just measuring uh, our ability to do assignments. And so um, I, I think that this, when it says equity lens shall be required for the implementation of grading procedures, that's sort of uh, enabling more educational supports to be put towards students of disadvantaged backgrounds instead of just, uh, just focusing on grades. And I... <laughs> Ms. Rowe, just the question that you asked about the class rank, it, it just really baffled me because um, that isn't an equitable look at Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, it's looking at a specific select student. When this equity lens that's in this policy is saying that we will be looking at the circumstances of all students. Um, I don't know if that made much sense, <laughs> but uh, I just think that we, we should be looking at the whole picture of how this is affecting all of students instead of how it's affecting um, a small minority of students in high school. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dr. Hager. 
Um, I just wanted to bring it back to Ms. Mack's original comment because she, she had asked to have this policy pulled out. Um, so is this the policy that led to homework not being graded, lowest scores being implemented, and the redos, and all of those big changes that happened in 2016, is that correct? So, and it sounds like from what Mr. Offerman said, there was a committee that has been evaluating the impact of those major grading changes? The committee has been um, meeting to review and see is, is there updates or revisions that need to be made. Now, I think uh, to Dr. Williams' point, there is, you know, when, when we use the expression evaluation, what exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about reviewing to revise or are we, or is it evaluation based on, you know, a set criteria that it, it, it was intended to do X and is it in fact doing X? So. So the committee, I mean, and Ms. Shea, if you want to add, the committee has been uh, meeting to listen to feedback and to make recommendations for around revision. Right. And, and if I can add to that, the committee actually, um, as you can see, the policy was not where they spent a lot of their energy and revision. It's about the implementation. And so a lot of the work that we spent was taking the guiding principles that are in the um, procedures manual. Um, and really talking about what was the impact in implementation. What do we need to do differently around clarifying professional learning for teachers, communication for students. To Mr. Thomas's point about students understanding, um, and to Ms. Rose's point, to your daughter has clarity around what matters and what counts, and how are we advocating for students and families to understand it. So that's where the committee is. So there is an evaluative component in that we bring a lot of stakeholders together from their perspectives to talk about that implementation and the impact. And then they are in the process of making recommendations to the procedures and mostly to the professional learning and communication around that implementation because that's where the rubber really meets the road. Well, and I, I'm personally concerned about college and career readiness mm -hmm. as a parent who's lived through the, the big change in 2016. Yeah. Um, would it be appropriate to modify the policy to ask for a report from the committee annually every other year or something, you know, whatever, whatever that might be? Would that, I don't know. A discussion among board members, so, some, some modifications such that we could, um, in policy, because I get that most of the work is done in the role. Mm -hmm. so. sure. Yes, Ms. Jones. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Ms. Shea. You explained everything really succinctly. Thank you. Uh, I do want to state that when what Dr. Hager is stating, it seems like you're going into the operations of what Dr. Williams will be implementing the policy. And that's my concern is that instead of approving this policy, we're going into operations and implementation of the how mm -hmm. of which is Dr. Williams and staff's job. So that's my only concern. And with that, I would like to move, is there, if there's a motion on the floor, move the previous question. All right. There's no motion on the floor. It was just, it was pulled out for discussion. Um, but there's no motion yet, so. Still more conversation. Okay, yes, Ms. Pastor and then Ms. Mack. Okay, Ms. Mack. I just think that because 5210 has been brought to the board for review, that review needs to include any of the findings of the committee, um, any changes as a result of the findings of the committee, and I think it would be premature to approve this policy without that information. And, and could I ask who's on the committee? I didn't know there was a committee until right now. The PRC committee or? The committee that talk, is talking about 5210. Oh, okay. 
So, so again, to clarify, the committee is the grading and reporting committee. It's comprised of teachers, parents, community stakeholder groups, principals, school counselors, central office folks. They have been coming together. Um, this year we met, I wanna say, quarterly. Um, part of the work of that committee was reviewing this policy because it was coming up and that was a part of the stakeholder group. What continued on from there were talking about recommendations and revisions to the implementation procedures in outlined in the procedures manual. So it is not an evaluation committee, if you will. It is stakeholders, a variety of stakeholders that provide their perspective on the implementation and offer suggestions for improvement. They were offered the opportunity to give um, insight into the policy as well as the rule language. And then now we're working on the procedures manual. So in, I in guess, Ms. Shea, my follow-up question to that is, sure. I have many teachers contact me and and have very strong opinions about this. Sure. And I think I hear you saying that we wouldn't make any changes to the grading policy, which is in conflict with what I'm hearing from teachers who don't think having a lowest score, who don't think have having redos up until the day before grades go in is is good for children. Right. If so I, I guess where I'm trying to I understand that you're saying it's an implementation issue, but if the policy is what states that lowest score and multiple redos and, you know, I, I think the policy needs work. But that, uh, if I can, that language is in okay. the procedures manual. Right. Sorry, that was time. So we really do need to vote on this and move on because we still have other policies that came from the PRC w um, without recommendations of the board. So. Um, yes, Dr. Williams. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, I would like to make a motion. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, no, Dr. Williams was recognized. I had already recognized Dr. Williams. So, okay, I'll wait. So thank you, um, Chairwoman Scott. So listening to this conversation and the pre, the work before the pandemic, my first year, um, I met with stakeholder groups teachers, students, and maybe what we can do is just convene this ongoing stakeholder groups that we have every year and talk about the implementation of the grading and reporting policy. You're talking about teachers, and definitely that's, that was a big conversation, including our principals. They had a, they had a perspective. But when I talk to the students, I want to go back to the ones who are actually getting the grade. I think that is an area that we need to focus on. So this is a policy. I would offer that once a year, we work together with our stakeholder groups, our teachers, and maybe even parents. Parents and that, I had a parent group, and it, their, their focus was really on something else. But maybe we look at our ongoing stakeholder groups, meet with them about the implementation, and I'll say it again, so everyone heard me, I say parents, st uh, staff, principals, students, and get their feedback about the implementation. But I, I do wanna say, and this is how we started, every classroom is made up of different students and different needs, and it's not that they're deficits. There's also kids who got the material and then how do you differentiate and accelerate? And so that is the role of the professional teacher to look at who's sitting in the room and, and adjust. But if your questions, it seems like the questions are coming around the implementation of the policy. So I would offer that we provide an update to the board based on stakeholder groups and their feedback. We can work through the unions, we can work through this student government, student council, to, to provide this feedback about the implementation of this policy. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Ms. Clausey, you had a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to um, make a motion that the policy 5210 is amended. I, I emailed it. <clears throat> The superintendent will provide an annual report about the implementation of this policy and any evaluations that have been done. Okay. I just, I just Sorry, you went out at the very beginning. Could you repeat your motion again? Um, 
so that everybody could hear what you said? I, and I did receive the email. Yes. yes. I move that policy 5210 is amended to include the superintendent will provide an annual report about the implementation of this policy and any evaluations that have been done. Second, okay, so Ms. Causey made a motion to amend the policy to read the, to add the language that the superintendent will provide an annual report about the implementation of this policy and any evaluations that have been done. And that was seconded by Ms. Mack. Okay, um, if we could, Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote <coughs> on that, please. Excuse me, Madam Chair, may I speak to my motion? Well, it, it seems self-explanatory, and it seems like we've <coughs> spoken at length about this. So um, it's, it's self-explanatory. So I, I, in the interest of time, it would be um, great if we could just vote on it. Okay, it will be brief. So the policy states several things. One of the things that it states is the standards, that grades will have consistent meaning throughout the school system and be based on grade level and course expectations as outlined in the curriculum. However, in a policy review committee meeting where it was being discussed uh, with curriculum and instruction staff, they stated that um, even as of this point when the policy has been in place and the procedures have been in place for a couple years, that not all schools have the same grading scale. Some grading use a grading scale of 50 to 100. Some use a grading scale of 0 to 100. Um, so that is not uh, with fidelity to the board's policy. Um, there's also um, part of the policy that says the board believes that grades are an essential way to communicate student progress. Uh, as such, grading reporting practices shall include meaningful feedback on student achievement. And there were discussions in policy review committee around this, around the low score, as um, Dr. Hager pointed out, where that may not have meaning uh, when in fact a student may not have performed enough work to even receive that low score. Um, and it was pointed out too about the timing um, being very late in the, in the marking period. So I think it is important that the board understand the implementation, whether the implementation is effective, whether the policy is clear enough. Um, and as it was stated by Ms. Shea, there's already work that's being done um, and so I think it's important that that work be shared with the board and then the board can uh, discuss whether it, it, it wants any uh, additional clarification in the policy. Okay. Are there any questions towards that? Are we going to be able to ever, ever move on and vote on anything and actually continue? Or are we going to continue to have the PRC committee at our full board meeting? Because that's what this now is. This is basically we're having our PRC committee meeting here. Who else? There's more questions. Go ahead. Let's st go ahead. Stay all night. Let's go. Who's next? Okay. Are we moving on? Okay. Ms. Gover, can we take a roll call vote, please, on the motion as amended? And I will read it. Ms. Causey moved to amend the policy and made a motion that the superintendent will provide an annual report about the implementation of this policy and any evaluations that have been done and it was seconded by Ms. Mack. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Yes. 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 Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? No. Ms. Penn? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Austin? No. Ms. Pester? No. Yes. Mr. Yes. Ms. No. Okay, so the, it passes, so that language is included. So now, do I have a motion to move policy? I what it is, 5210 Second, as amended forward. To, um, so moved, everybody. Second reader. Right. Thank you. Is there a second? Okay. It's looking, all right. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Brown? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Austin? 
Yes. 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 And we now have three more policies. Thank you, ladies. Policy Review Committee has moved the following policies to the full board without a recommendation so that we can discuss it here and have committee here. That's policy 8221, internal board policies, 80, policy 8311, internal board policies, and policy 8314, internal board policies, operating meeting and agenda. And these policies are presented to you in tonight's exhibit, SG. Yes, Ms. Jose. I move that these policies go back to the PRC for recommendation. Second, Thomas. Ms. Jose has moved that the three policies go back to PRC for recommendation, and it was seconded by Mr. Thomas. Um, Ms. Gover, could we take a roll call vote on those, please, on that, please? Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Cosby? Yes. 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 Oh, yes. Excuse me. Yes, Miss Mack. No, I don't believe we are. Um, Mr. Bersades, if you could weigh in on that, but I don't believe so. By moving it back to committee, um, would that preclude us discussing policy 8311 at our board retreat? You shouldn't be discussing policy 8311 at your board retreat. Oh. Did we say policy 8311 exactly when we discussed it? I'm looking for the for the email that you're referencing where you, you said we were discussing policy 8311 on our board retreat. Not 8311, but how we would handle What you're referring to is the ability to call in. Right. Um, is that, would that be, I don't believe that, is that tied to policy 8311? It is. It is? It is, so it needs to be discussed. Yeah. Open I, I just didn't want to violate open meetings, that's all. Okay. If it is in, and we shouldn't be discussing policy then, um, we need to revisit that and look at that. What we can probably do, um, Ms. Hen is suggesting that we can probably put it on the next agenda for the next open session. Thank you for bringing that up now. Are we halfway done? God. Oh my God. Oops, sorry, excuse me. So the next item on the agenda is unfinished business consideration of board policy. Um, Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policy, policy 3231 vendor performance evaluation. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as exhibit H. Do I have a motion to accept Thank the recommendations of the pop? I'm sorry? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. I have a motion to policy 3231. Of course you do. Okay, um, and let me just see, do I need to, do we need to have a motion um, 
Okay, so you want to make the motion before we accept the recommendation. Is it appropriate now for yeah, her to make a motion, perfect. Mr. Brusades? Okay. All right. Yes, Ms. Cosey, go ahead with your motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I emailed this to all of the board members. Um, I moved policy 3231 be amended as follows. The Office of Purchasing shall establish procedures for evaluating, documenting, reporting vendor performance under contract for purchase of goods, performance of services, consulting, construction, construction management, building renovation, or improvement facilities. These procedures shall include a process for performance appraisal, communication feedback to vendors, forms, and documentation requirements, a process for suspension of debarment of unsatisfactory vendors and the vendor appeal process. The Office of Purchasing shall establish procedures Sorry, I just got an alert that I need to send. Hi, Ms. Causey. I, I'm so sorry. We're, we're having uh, quite a time hearing you. Um, I wasn't sure if you were asking a question or if you were making a motion because I, I, we can't really hear you. Um, and I hate to ask you to repeat that again, but if you could please, sure. and then also send it in an email because I'm not. Yes, thank you. I had sent it in the email earlier, but uh, I just sent it again so it's. I guess at the top of the stack. Uh, um, and before I read the rest of it, I just wanted to say that I evaluate, I uh, went to the rule and just uh, copied from there the specifics related to uh, the timing of the evaluations and also the dollar value of the contracts that's already in the rule. Uh, and the only modification really is that the um, in addition to the construction contract, the non-construction contracts uh, need to be evaluated, that exceed 500,000 need to be evaluated semi-annually. Okay, so- We had discussed this at the prior meeting. This okay, could you state your motion, Ms. Claus? So you said you have a motion, so um, could you state your motion so that I can properly restate it and then we can vote on it so that we can um, process this meeting? Certainly. <clears throat> I move policy 3231 be amended as follows. The Office of Purchasing shall establish procedures for evaluating, documenting, and reporting vendor performance under a contract for purchase of goods, performance of services, consulting construction, construction management, building renovation, or improvement of facilities. These procedures shall include a process for performance appraisal, communication of feedback to vendors, forms and documentation requirements, a process for suspension or debarment of unsatisfactory vendors and a vendor appeal process. The Office of Purchasing. Oh, snap. <laughs> she disconnected. We all have it in our emails. It's really long. Um, Mr. Mercedes, is it appropriate for me to, without her, here to go ahead and, and process this yes it is she, uh, she's she's emailed it to you so okay because she you got can, really you can do almost, it for her okay thank you is there a second she it's an email yeah does it need to be read out loud for the public I need to once I state it, though, the motion comes to the floor, so I'm seeing if there's a second. Got it, got it, got it. I had a question about it. Do have to read it. I have to read it first because it's not, it's, not, it's not officially on the floor yet because I haven't read it. Got it. Okay, so she read it, and then now I'm asking. She didn't read the whole thing. Okay, so then I will read it in her place. All right. I move policy 3231 be amended as follows. The Office of Purchasing shall establish procedures for evaluating, documenting, and reporting vendor performance under a contract for purchase of goods, performance of service, consulting, construction, construction management, building renovation, or improvement of facilities. These procedures shall include a process for performance, appraisal, communication of feedback to vendors, forms, and documentation requirements, a process for suspension, or 
Department of Unsatisfactory Vendors and a vendor appeal process, the Office of Purchasing shall establish procedures for reporting the above evaluation components to the board on a timely basis as reasonable, including when contracts come before the board, approval regarding modification, substantial change, order, renewal, extension, discontinuance, or other action, non-construction contracts, A, dot, all BCPS contracts that exceed half a million dollars except for those construction contracts outlined in paragraph four shall require a vendor performance evaluation semi-annual and within 30 days of completion of the contract. B, vendor performance evaluation should be completed annually by the sponsoring office for open-ended contracts for, or purchase orders. The Office of Purchasing may request a, ve a vendor performance evaluation more frequently than required by this paragraph if necessary in order to facilitate proper management of the vendor construction contracts. A, vendor performance evaluations are required for all BCPS contracts for construction, construction management, re building renovation or facility improvements that exceed half a million dollars. B, vendor performance evaluation shall be completed semi-annually by the Department of Physical Facilities through the duration of the contract and a final evaluation shall be prepared within 30 days of substantial completion of the contract. The Department of Physical Facilities may perform more frequent evaluations if necessary in order to facilitate proper management of the vendor. Statewide contracts, the Office of Purchasing will develop for evaluation of system-wide contracts including A, school and office staff that use BCPS system-wide contracts may forward information regarding vendor performance to the Office of Purchasing at any time. B, the Office of Purchasing may survey users of system-wide contracts in order to gather feedback on vendor performance. Do I have a second? So that was a motion moved by Ms. Causey that I read for her because they, she's um, was disconnected. So is there a second to that motion? Okay, I don't hear a second. So then um, I will continue with the, my script. Do I have a motion to accept the recommendation so moved. of the Board's Policy Review Committee? So moved. Second, Thomas. <laughs> well, no second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Any questions? Madam Ms. Chair, Go this is Ms. Causey. Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Somehow I got disconnected from <clears throat> the meeting. Um, and I heard you reading the amendment, and I appreciate that. Um, while it was um, lengthy, the, it came from uh, the rule modified a bit because currently this policy um, does not uh, provide that contracts as large as $200 million uh, would be evaluated except at the end of the contract. Okay. And this, um, Prior to these Excuse me, Ms. Causey. I appreciate end. you joining us, but there was no okay, second. So there was there was no second to the motion, so you can't speak no to second. the motion. No, there was no second. So that's why um, that's why I, I read it again, and so that we were clear. And there was no second to the motion, so we we can't speak to the motion. It was already moved um, to accept the uh, committee's recommendation, and then now um, it's time for us to do a roll call vote. Well, I, I just have to make so, a comment that this is Ms. not Scott, uh, this, is, this policy Excuse is me. not sufficient. All right, Ms. Causey, a point of order was called by Ms. Jose. Ms. Jose, what is the point yes. you're raising? Motion on the floor that's been seconded. It's okay. There is a, so she raised the point that there is a motion on the floor, um, okay, and it was seconded. Motion when it's my turn. Well, we're about to vote on it and um, move through it. So well, then, I, then I would like to speak to it before we vote. But your motion, you can't speak to your motion because there was no second. That's correct. I can speak to the motion that's on the floor. To okay, yes, policy. you can speak to the motion that's on the floor. Okay, so this, the motion as it stands does not uh, allow the, uh, does not require the school system nor allow it, according to staff at the last meeting, to review non-construction contracts more than at the end of their contract. And we have seen contracts come through for um, tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. And <clears throat> as was also seen at the last meeting, um, evaluations are done inconsistently because of this policy. We have received repeat findings from the Office of Legislative Audit related to procurement, as well as the UHY audit related to procurement. Um, and so, 
if uh, there's not time to process it at this meeting, I would just suggest board members to uh, not approve the policy. You can take more time to review the amendment, or maybe I can uh, redo it and we can revisit it at the next meeting. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may we do a roll call vote, please? Yes. No. Abstain. <laughs> yes. Ms. Hunt? Abstain. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Hughes? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. So it moves forward. Okay. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the Board of Education. Um, in a few short weeks, schools across the Baltimore County will welcome students and staff back to our buildings for face-to-face -face instruction five days a week. There is a slide that I want to show. So hats off to our school and central office teams who have been busy preparing for the start of this coming school year, 21-22. As I visited schools, offices, and events, I've enjoyed connecting with community members, all as hopeful as I am for a new and exciting year of learning. Uh, next week, our teachers and other professionals uh, will begin their year-long induction program at a new educator's orientation. Also next week, both school and central office leaders will come together for our annual administrative and supervisory meeting to kick off the new school year. I look forward to welcoming our 10-month staff back to schools and offices on Monday, August 23rd for professional learning and classroom preparation. Our first day of school is Monday, August 30th, and I'm excited about seeing our students back in school. Together, staff, students, and families will make this a great year for BCPS students. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. You've seen this before, just to reiterate, next year includes three specific areas of focus. Healing, acknowledging the year, take the lessons learned, and support the social and emotional needs of students, staff, and one another. Recovering, reestablishing bonds, relational trust, effective practices and processes that will help us build our collective capacity to serve and support students across BCPS and rebuild. Take the opportunity to refine and implement a standard of excellence where we focus on a limited number of priorities that yield maximum results. Next slide, please. Of course, as we Experience last school year, conditions related to the COVID-19 continue to change. We will continue to monitor the transmission of COVID-19 in Baltimore County and to receive guidance from federal and state leaders, the Centers for, Cent for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and various health experts. Our goal remains providing a learning environment that minimizes health risks, maximizes attendance for all students and aligns with best health practices. In service of our goal, we are committed to the following weekly meetings with health partners to ensure we are receiving sound scientific advice to inform our decision making, continue focus on health and safety mitigation, including vaccinations, universal masking for staff and students in schools and offices as is appropriate based on current data, and plan responses to shifting metrics developed in collaboration with community partners. Additionally, we will work with school teams to identify a process for students to receive work if they become ill or in quarantine. Again, please check www.bcps.org for our latest updates and please encourage everyone age 12 and above to get vaccinated. Next slide, please. This fall, you will hear continued reference to a layered mitigation, science-based health and safety practices, including access to vaccination clinics, physical distancing, hand washing, and respiratory etiquette, and healthy operations. These multiple methods will help to ensure that we preserve and protect face-to-face -face learning for our students. 
preserve and protect face-to-face -face learning for our students. Simply put, we want to do all we can to safely keep students in classrooms this academic year. Next slide. Our last day of summer school was Friday, August 5th. <laughs> summer learning hike will be available through Friday, August 20th, and our weekly book suggestions will be provided throughout this month on our webpage. Student orientation, referred to as early entry day, for students entering grades one, six, seven, nine, and 10, will be conducted on Friday, August 27th. Students in our virtual learning program will have orientation on Friday, August 27th as well, in a virtual format. Kindergarten students will experience a gradual entry process with the first full day on Wednesday, September 1st. Traditional elementary sneak a peek opportunities will be communicated in annual back to school mailings. School leaders will communicate back to school night information and other creative opportunities to connect directly with families and communities. Next slide. So, Athletics. Baltimore County Public Schools will be modifying our student athletic eligibility, Rule 6702, to allow students the opportunity to participate in BCPS interscholastic athletic program for the 21 fall athletic season, as long as the student is making satisfactory progress towards graduation. And BCPS will be considering students as making satisfactory progress towards graduation based on earning credits towards grade promotion. Uh, standard eligibility requirements will resume for students at the start of the second marking period. This is aligned with many of the other larger school districts um, that are in Maryland. Next slide. Food and nutrition. BCPS recognized that meal provision is an essential support to many of our students. All students, say it again, all students will receive free meals this school year. In school meal service will resume with morning breakfast. Lunch will be served through Lunch will be served through the serving lines and the school cafeterias. Standing operating procedures related to sanitation and the use of PPE products will be incorporated according to CDC guidelines and available for all cafeteria staff engaged in food preparation and service. Mobile meal sites will be available for all virtual students to pick up meals and locations will be posted on the, on the Office of Food and Nutrition Service webpage. Next slide. So, accelerated learning ensures that students spend the majority of their time on grade or course level material with appropriate scaffolds in place to ensure the work is accessible. In alignment with the new teacher project, identify best practices to support accelerated learning. BCPS staff has worked to prioritize grade level content for each, each subject and course identify opportunities to leverage digital materials from virtual learning for teacher use in pre-teaching prior instructional content and academic vocabulary to support priority standards, develop rich tasks to diagnose unfinished learning in priority content areas, and adapt curricula scope and sequences to include opportunities for acceleration support and scaffolding of priority standards. Next slide. As you know, the state requested all local school systems to create a virtual learning option for families. BCPS has always had an e-learning option for students. Our virtual learning program differs because it provides a K-12 option for families in direct response to the pandemic. Our virtual option for families will not include concurrent teaching. Dedicated staff will plan and deliver lessons to students enrolled in our program. It's important to note that students remain co-enrolled in their homeschool and VLP for the year. They also will have access to homeschool resources, including sports, meals, and extracurricular activity. It goes without saying that we want all of our students to learn at high levels. If a student is not being successful at the VLP or virtual learning program with enhanced supports, a collaborative decision will be made with the staff, homeschool staff, and parents regarding student placement. So, we have heard from our families who have shared their desire to take part in the VLP. Despite the fact that the original extended deadline has passed, we will work to explore options to work with individual families while recognizing program constraints. Next slide. 
Data analysis processes and procedures are essential in driving instruction for learning acceleration. We will use a thoughtful, balanced approach focused on multiple measures. You heard me say that before many times, looking at multiple measures for students, including internal and external assessment to measure student learning. BCPS unit diagnostic tasks and unit assessment align to the Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards along with the fall MCAP and MAP data will serve as our leading metrics to identify baseline data and set goals. We will work to diagnose unfinished learning, monitor progress, and implement responsive teaching practices in order to help improve student performance. Specific external assessment for the upcoming year include kindergarten readiness assessment, census test testing for this coming year, MSDE early fall assessments in English language arts and mathematics for grades three through eight, English language arts in 10th grade and high school math assessment for students who've completed Algebra 1 Geometry or Algebra 2 last year but did not participate in spring testing. Science testing, the MISA, will be conducted for students who are enrolled grades 5 and 8 during, uh, who were enrolled in grades 5 and 8 during last year's school year as well as students have completed the life science courses. Uh, the MAP reading and mathematic assessment in the fall for grades students in grades one through eight. Additionally, we're planning to host the PSAT testing during the school day in October for students enrolled in grades nine through 11 and the SAT day in April for all grade 11 students. We will provide regular student participation performance updates throughout the school year. Next slide. So the Maryland State Department of Education and the American Rescue Plan Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief grant requires all school systems to publicly post a reopening plan for 21-22 school year under the overarching concept of the continuity of learning during the global COVID-19 pandemic. It is further required that the plans be updated minimally every six months through 2024. Elements of our plan include safe return to in-person instruction, continue focus on equity for students, commitment to identifying and meeting the instructional and social emotional needs of students and staff, and continuity of services that address and maintain high, uh, uh, health and safety of students and staff. Our plan uh, will be submitted to MSDE by August 13th for feedback and they expect us to post our plan on our website by August 14th. Last slide. We will continue to update the board, our community and team BCPS about our opening plans. Today's report is based on the information we have right now. As we have learned, things continue to shift and move based on changing conditions. We look forward to providing additional reports on opening, we will share any additional information that we receive from the Maryland Health Department, Maryland State Department of Education, and our local health partners. This concludes Dr. Williams' report. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Williams. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the chair's report. And um, that's my report and I just am happy that we are, um, even though it's a hybrid fashion, but that we were able to uh, accommodate and have in-person uh, board meetings and um, to accommodate the public and to hear from you all and um, to basically be in this room again. So uh, I think that's, that's wonderful and I'm looking forward to it and I'm looking forward to a great school year and all the things that Dr. Williams discussed. And um, I didn't know if my video is ready. It is? Okay, then. <laughs> we have another episode of the Chairwoman's Corner. <laughs> Hello. My name is Makita Scott, and I am the chair of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In this series, I highlight BCPS students and educators for an inside look at teaching and learning today. The first three stories I want to highlight today have to do with the strength of BCPS music instruction. In June, 
Brittany Spencer, a 2006 graduate of George Washington Carver Center for Arts and Technology, came back to the school. She was there to tape an interview for CBS this morning. A rising star, Spencer is breaking barriers in country music. She has been named part of CMT's Next Women of Country and an artist to watch by Spotify and Pandora. She credits Carver Center for giving her a strong foundation. Reed Spaulding, a rising junior at Towson High School, is organizing the Tributary Music Festival that will be held on Sunday, September 26, from 2 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Admission is free, but funds raised through merchandise sales and raffles will be donated to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. One of the many bands performing in the festival features Morgan Gonks, a rising sophomore at Carver Center. Morgan, who is only 14 years old, has already won a local songwriting contest, performed during an Orioles game, and auditioned for a Broadway musical. What's next? This <laughs> month, one of her songs will be featured during WTMD's virtual First Thursday event, and in January, she will perform at the International Blues Challenge. And let me tell you about one more extraordinary BCPS student. This summer, Duni Ojumu, a 2021 graduate of Western School of Technology, placed first in an international medical terminology competition and placed third in a national medical terminology competition. According to Bethany Barago, Academy of Health Professions teacher at Western Tech, placing that high is almost impossible. Dooney, who participated in Western Tech's Academy of Health Professionals, will attend Harvard University this fall. She plans to study neuroscience. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time for From the Chairwoman's Corner. And thank you so much. <laughs> we have some awesome kids. <laughs> really do. And on that note, we have the next item on the agenda, the student member of the board report, Mr. Christian Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Superintendent Williams, the board members, the public, and students of BCPS. As I began, began to prepare for today's board meeting, I realized that I never actually formally introduced myself to you all. So. Hello everyone, my name is Christian Ray Thomas, the 2021-2022 student member of the board, a rising senior at Eastern Technical High School, Techia, and a 17-year-old teen who, as of about five or six hours ago, just passed his driver's test. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I am a multiracial student with a very diverse family, being part black, white, and Mexican. Have been a student in BCPS and a resident of both Perry Hall and Essex my entire life, and until recently was a low-income free and reduced meal service. And I am also a member of the LGBTQ plus community. And that last part of my identity, being a member of the L lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer plus community is one of the many, many reasons I am here today on the board. I'm here to ensure that us LGBTQ plus kids are at, have a seat at the governance here in BCPS, to provide a perspective of what it's like to be a gay student in BCPS, what it's like to face the brunt of bullying in elementary school for being more feminine at times, to talk about myself and students like me who have been targeted by homophobic and transphobic slurs left and right, who have faced microaggressions for simply living as our authentic selves, to show students like me that we have a voice, we can speak our truth, and that we will be heard on this board and throughout our lives. I am here today and will be here tomorrow and for the rest of this year to give us a voice. And with that, I am motioning to, I am motioning to adopt the following resolution titled LGBTQ plus resolution. And it reads, whereas students experiencing discrimination or harassment based on sex, male, female, sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression are at a significant risk of a rank of health, safety, and educational problems, and whereas in schools, conversations to foster equitable improvements and acknowledge diversity 
oft, are often implicitly and or explicitly excluding L lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, non-binary, and other queer individuals. And whereas board policy 0100 equity declares that disparities on the basis of gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity, including gender expression, are unacceptable and are, at direct, and are directly at odds with the belief that all students can achieve. Therefore, be it resolved that the board promises to educate itself as an entity on the composition of and disparities for students of the LGBTQ plus community from issues of bullying, harassment, and lack of gender identity recognition, and be it further resolved that the board supports discussion about sex, male, female, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression within classroom curriculum material, professional development, and extracurricular activities, allowing students and staff to become educated on the LGBTQ plus community, and be it further resolved that the board supports the decision of students for gender expression, including accommodations for the use of school facilities corresponding to the gender they consistently identify and the right and the right for individuals to be addressed by names and pronouns corresponding to their gender identity. Still reading. So thank you. So you made a motion for the board to adopt this resolution. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Is there a second? Second. Sec <laughs> Second, Hager. Thank you. Okay, so we have the motion to accept, um, for the board to accept um, Mr. Thomas's LGBTQ plus inclusivity resolution. Did I? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> and it was seconded um, by um, Dr. Hager. Are there discussion? Yes, Miss Miss Rowe. So I just have a few points. Um, I support the, the, the equity policy that we have, and certainly we shouldn't ever discriminate against anyone in the LGBTQ community. However, there are certain parts of this resolution that are problematic because typically these um, subjects that are in the second uh, to last and the last result are things that are contained in sexual education health classes that parents have the right to opt out of. And I'm concerned that in passing this resolution, particularly the portion where it says um, that the board supports discussion about sex, male, female, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender within classroom curriculum material, that that does not simply specify classroom curriculum material in health class. And I do not believe that since parents have strongly expressed the desire to opt their students out of sexual education classes, that we should embed sexual education within every other subject of the school system, which parents can't opt out of. And additionally, the third result where it says that um, the board supports the decision of students for gender expression, including accommodations for the use of school facilities corresponding to gender they consistently identify and the right indiv of individuals to be addressed by names and pronouns corresponding with their gender identity. So there is currently no legal right for students to be addressed by particular pronouns and the Sixth Circuit Appellate Court has recently decided that a college university professor had the right to sue a state university because they penalized him in his employment for his refusal in his free exercise of his religion, First Amendment right, to call a student by a particular pronoun and instead use that student's last name. So given that the courts are weighing in on this and that that case was kicked back to the lower court, and I don't think that we should be creating rights that the courts have not yet spoken about. And this resolution appears to do that. I also don't agree that my 10 year old girl should have to share a bathroom with a penis. I just can't. So uh, that's my time. And for those specific reasons, I cannot support this. May I answer? Uh okay, thank you for that, Ms. Rowe. Yes, and I was gonna, um ask you if you had a response. Thank you. All right, so for the first thing you brought up about uh, support discussions about sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression within classroom curriculum material, um, I don't think that 
in the way that it's written, suggesting that this would be done in every classroom curriculum material, I think that would go to the superintendents and the operations department of how that would be implemented. Um, and right now, uh, these conversations are currently happening in some capacity uh, from what I've experienced in school, uh, in our schools, but uh, this would just make sure that uh, as a board, we are making sure that we are having an inclusive lens for the LGBTQ community um, and do support that uh, in the health classes that that curricula would continue to be established. Secondly, you made the comment about not wanting your 10-year-old daughter to share a bathroom with someone who has a penis. Um, and I don't necessarily agree with that statement based on what it's, it reads here. It says, including accommodations for the use of school facilities corresponding to the gender they consistently identify. Um, and so accommodations does not necessarily mean using the same bathroom as a uh, a, a, cur a current male or female bathroom that we have in schools. Accommodations could mean that we are creating um, intersex bathrooms in our schools. We are providing uh, uh, a space for our students to ha use the bathroom um, where they are not in the bathroom with other individuals. And so I, I think that this isn't this policy. This resolution here isn't mandating that. It's just saying that the board supports that uh, students have the right to have accommodations met for their gender identity, and and and, and it's saying that the board supports the gender expression of students. Um, and I find your comment uh, about the penis to be uh, uh, <laughs> just very ignorant. Is the is the way that, that I can say that. Um, in a nice way, I can say that. So. Uh, I understand your, your points, uh, but I, I don't think the way that this policy reads that it's in any way suggesting that your 10-year-old daughter will um, will be forced to share a bathroom with someone of a different gender identity. It's saying that there will be accommodations met for students that um, need to use the bathroom that corresponds with their gender expression. Thank you, Christian. Were there any other questions? Yes, um, Mr. Kuhn. So uh, thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, Mr. Thomas, um, I have some reservations also about this. Um, I believe the equity uh, policy we have, in fact, already uh, speaks to uh, a lot of what you have here. Um, but again, uh, you know, what you just said about uh, school facilities, for, you know, including accommodations for the use of school facilities corresponding to the gender they consistently identify with. In essence, you kind of contradicted yourself in that exact discussion and made a point, I don't know if maybe contradicted what you're saying isn't accurate, but your point being your um, perception of that and Ms. Rowe's perception of that were, were vastly different. and. If the board moves forward with this, who is going to interpret that uh, could leave it up to how they they read it and how they interpret it. So, you know, I, I have reservations about this and I won't be supporting it the way it's currently written. And um, I hope, and I'm not trying to say that to reflect on you poorly because I think that, you know, you're taking a step forward and, and, and coming forward with this, um, which we only received this afternoon. So unfortunately, we couldn't have any of these conversations beforehand. But, um, uh, you know, there are um, you know, parents that are vastly concerned about this. And um, I, I have to weigh their, their rights and their concerns also. So, you know, thank you for bringing this forward. But I, I, won't, be, I won't be supporting it in, the current, in its current format. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I respond uh, to? Oh. Yes, go ahead and, and respond. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kuhn, so what you said before, uh, your first thing, uh, stating that you believe equity policy uh, 0100 already addresses this. Uh, in the first, uh, <coughs> second whereas clause, it says, um, in schools, conversations to foster equitable improvements acknowledge diversity, often implicitly and or explicitly exclude lesbian, gay, but transgender, non-binary, and other queer individuals. And so while the equity policy does address this, and it's stated in the third whereas clause that, uh, that equity policy does address this, it isn't in implementation or an action, actually, we aren't actually having conversations about LGBTQ plus youth in any way. I haven't seen myself being reflected in the conversations we're having. When we talk about uh, the importance of understanding diversity and including individuals, we don't ever include LGBTQ plus kids. I haven't been included 
and, and so that's where this resolution comes in, titled LGBTQ plus inclusivity. Simply putting some accountability on the Board of Education and on BCPS to make sure that we are including LGBTQ plus kids in our decisions, and not just stating that we will, but actually doing it. And uh, I don't remember what your second comment was, or concern was. Um, can you repeat it real quick? I'm sorry. I wish I could. Um, <laughs> I, I Oh, I remember it. Now, the accommodations portion and, and how um, that would be implemented. Uh, again, I think that would go back into uh, an operational uh, operations department. That's how it would be implemented and, and discussed. And I think this is just saying that um, we support the idea that accommodations will be met, um, and that would be a decision made by the superintendent and the staff. Thank you. Next, it was Ms. Mack, and then I believe Dr. Hager. I actually have a um, question for Dr. McComas or Ms. Shea. Um, in our last um, curriculum committee meeting that we had before the break for the summer, I believe we talked about the state mandated changes to sex education. Is that correct? That you talked about the change, Comars. Oh, Comars, okay. Comar changes to fifth grade health. And am I correct in those Comar changes that parents um, would ha they have, they would not have to, kids would be given that education um, unless parents opted out. I think before parents used to opt in, but with the change, parents must opt out. That is correct. Um, and that is a change, is that correct? So in that meeting, I expressed concerns about kids who had grown up in a sheltered home who, um, for whatever reason, whether religious, just upbringing, had not been exposed to the type of things that would be discussed in sex, sex education classes. I'm sure they're called something else, but I'm just going to say sex education classes. Um, I had a concern then, and I had a concern, and you know, I know parents are supposed to look in the folder and they're supposed to be on top of things, but parents have lives, that we weren't giving parents enough information to know that, you know, I think one of the big changes that was kind of shocking for me because I'm old was that menstruation was going to be talked about in a class with boys and girls. And I thought, wow, I hope parents are paying attention because I personally think kids would be embarrassed by that. So my issue, I guess, is to Ms. Rose's point, you know, I believe parents should have the option to opt out of anything that doesn't jive with how they raise their kids. Um, I support this um, because I support inclusivity, but I do have a concern about that. And then about the bathrooms, Time. Um, you know, do we have the funds to do that? Okay. Did you want to respond, Dr. Williams? The only thing I would like to respond, and, and I'm looking at Ms. Shea and Dr. McComb, we teach health classes. I knew so it was let's let's let's. I just I just want to be on the record. I know. I saw we have. I know. I know. But I, I just want to. Your name, but I, I just want to be clear. There are health classes <laughs> that we follow the curriculum, uh, MSDE. So I just want to clarify I that. I, I was saying it wrong. So I, I, thank no, you. no, no, no. I appreciate. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Dr. Williams. Um, Dr. Hager. Um, yes, I strongly support this, um, and I. Do worry that maybe some of some folks on the board are, are maybe a little sheltered um, themselves in that recognizing that we have an enormously growing population of students in schools that identify as LG, LGBTQ plus. In fact, in my kids' uh, middle school, the club alone tripled in size this year. So if this is a this is a really important issue for students in our schools, and I think that it's important that we as a board get behind that sooner rather than later. Um, we did extend policy 0100 last year with a resolution declaring that we believe that Black Lives Matter. So to me, this is right in line with kind of an extension of that policy and how our board kind of uh, resolves to really abide by that policy. 
And the last thing I'll say is I, I am really into data, as you guys know, and um, yeah. the, uh, the YRBS data that's collected um, usually every year, but um, or every other year um, in Maryland, um, they break it down, and there is actually a report online comparing kids who identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual compared to those who identify as heterosexual and risk behaviors. And it's so much higher for the kids who identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. And if we just use the right pronouns and uh, you know, address these kids as they want to be addressed, then I think it can make a big difference. And so I am a big advocate of this resolution. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, I'll speak next and then Ms. Pestor, if that's okay. Um, I just wanted to say that I support this resolution. I think that it's important. Um, and I've heard some board members talking about um, sheltered students and students who may not understand and who may be uncomfortable with, I guess, um, anatomical uh, or um, <laughs> uh, certain words and everything like that. But I guess where my mind goes is to those students who are uncomfortable every day because they can't be their true authentic selves, who may be LG, and, and Christian's helping me so that I don't embarrass myself, but so <laughs> <laughs> students who may be LGBTQ+. Plus. And, you know, we need the kids to feel comfortable to teach us who who may not n know as much or, or and everything like that. So I don't think it's something that we as a board should shy away from. Um, I think that it's something that, that we should embrace and support our children um, because they deserve to feel authentic, to be authentic and to be who they are and addressed in the way that suits them and how they envision themselves. And, and I, I just think that's very important to feel comfortable in the skin that you're in and in, in, in with who you are. Um, secondly, the part about the sex, where it says the board supports discussion about sex, I took that as um, whether or not someone is male, female, binary. Um, that's how I took it, not sex education, but just more of like a medical um, Terminology was was that the correct interpretation? Okay. Yeah. Yes, that is the correct interpretation, and I actually added in parentheses next to it a um, male slash female to make that distinction uh, okay. for board members. And so that's what I was saying. I didn't think of it as the act of sex. I didn't really think about like uh, sex education. I just thought of you know, male, female, how you identify, or if you don't identify as if if if, if as non-binary. Non-binary. Thank you so much. <laughs> So, um, yes, so I support this motion. Thank you. Ms. Pastor and then Ms. Yes. Henn. Um, I was just looking at the resolution when Mr. Thomas read it. He did say, based, every time he said sex, he said male or female. It's not in here, but he did. It's not in the one that I have anyway. I don't know. Maybe. Okay, maybe I'm looking at something else. Okay. But anyway, he did say male and female. So he, that's what he was talking about, not health education, Dr. Williams. Okay. Also, I think we've taken a giant leap somewhere else because he didn't say in this that he wants to have, uh, I know the question was, do we have the money for it? What he's asking here is that we just recognize and have discussions for our growth He's not saying that these things are to be implemented, that we just open ourselves to and apprise ourselves to the realities as Dr. Hager just expressed. That's all. This is about our growth so that we are better to accommodate and work with all of our children, whoever they are, wherever they are, and however they see themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor and Ms. Hen. Thank you. And Madam along Chair, the I'd like to speak when Ms. Hinn is done. This is yes, Ms. Clausey. Yep. Along that same vein, as Ms. Pester said, I'm going to rise above the details and focus on the intent of the motion and support this. And I love your title, Christian, that it's an inclusivity resolution because that is the spirit of this. And we would never want these kids to feel that they are not included. And that is why I will be supporting it and let the details work themselves out because that is the heart of what this resolution is about. So I will be supporting it for that reason. Thank you for bringing it to us. It's long overdue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Head. And Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to thank um, Mr. Thomas as a member of the board uh, for preparing this and bringing this to us. Uh, it's very important that uh, every board member feel comfortable bringing forward their uh, important issues. So I definitely appreciate 
uh, you bringing this. I would like to see um, staff have uh, time to clarify some of these operational issues because I would really like to see this uh, come back to the board when we have um, more time and maybe a little more um, information um, so that it could be a unanimous uh, support for this. Um, we do have policy 0100 uh, that speaks very clearly uh, that we do not want to discriminate, um, but it's also important, especially I believe about the mental health aspect and also about the uh, bullying that we really act on that because no student should feel bullied uh, for any reason. And um, unfortunately, the data, as Dr. Hager said, it, it is very discouraging in that regard. Um, so I would like to suggest that this uh, go to the next equity committee um, and have it just um, discuss a little further there and then come back to the board because I would really like to support it. I won't, um, with some of those questions answered about facilities, also from uh, uh, the Office of Law uh, around some of the these other issues, just to make sure that the board isn't um, stepping into operational issues without clarity. So I just wanted to thank you for that and, and perhaps we could consider um, that because I do think it's important to really spend time on this and uh, to support these efforts. So thank you. Thank you for that. Any more discussion? Okay. Yeah, we Ms. Uh, oh. Ms. Scott, I do, Mr. McMillian. Oh, yes. Certainly right, okay. Mr. McMillian. Me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Christian, do, uh, do you mind if I call you Christian? Would you prefer Mr. Thomas on the, on the TV or on the live show? <laughs> Christian, Christian is fine. <laughs> Okay, on your fifth paragraph, one, two, three, four, five, under the resolve, when you mentioned um, just gender identity and gender expression within classroom curriculum material, mm -hmm. would you enlighten me as to what grade level do you think that these conversations are appropriate for the kids to be engaged in? Thanks. Yes, of course. Uh, so my personal belief, I'll share that. And then uh, I, I want to say that this is not any reflection of what should be in the resolution today. But I personally believe that um, conversations about personal identity and the LGBTQ plus community should be being had all throughout the, uh, the education of individuals, starting K through 12, at varying levels, of course, starting off with just talking about what it means, what your identity is, and maybe kindergarten, first, second grade, going into maybe some details about the LGBTQ plus community in third, fourth, fifth grade, then talking about it in more detail as we get into the more uh, matured and developed life that we have, and students begin to understand who they are. I think that these conversations need to be having, being have, had early on because I was able to have those conversations early on with my family. I have two lesbian grandmothers, well, four lesbian grandmothers. Um, and so for my entire life, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, I've been surrounded by it. And I felt comfortable coming out at the age, in, in, in like what, seventh or eighth grade. And so I think that these conversations need to be happening everywhere because I've been in those groups that Dr. Hager mentioned with students who haven't had the support system from their families. And if we begin to show students of the support that they have from the beginning of their educational careers, then we're really able to do that. But I don't think that's something that should be addressed in this resolution, um, but that is my personal belief. And if I can call you Mr. Rod instead of Mr. McMillian, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Rod, that's, that's, what, that's what I've, I think. Christian, you can call me whatever you'd like to call me. And that includes late for dinner, too. That's a, that, that's a joke. It's a joke. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. McMillian. <laughs> um, Mr. Thomas, you had a question? Yes. Uh, one more comment that I want to make about this resolution is that I think one of the most important things to take from it is the first resolve that says that the board promises to educate itself as an entity on the composition of and disparities for students of the LGBTQ plus community. I know that no one's perfect, but uh, when talking to board members about the LGBTQ plus community, there have been times when we don't even know the acronym or we don't even uh, know a lot about the community. And I think that in order to make educated decisions about students and have an equitable lens, we need to be educated on this community as well as all the other identity groups and communities we have in BCPS. Just this one has been 
shoved under the rug, we haven't been talking about it, and that's what this resolution is, is really about, making sure that we are talking about it. So thank you all. Thank you. Ms. Jost, yes. Thank you, Christian, for bringing this to the board. Um, I've had a very conservative background and upbringing. I went to a Catholic school, and a lot of people you know, call me a prude. But one of the key things that I learned was that our uniqueness, our individuality, and our experience molds us into who we are. And the first step towards um, change is awareness. The second step is acceptance. And I was always taught to be kind and accepting. And so I'm really proud of what you're doing. That takes a lot of courage. I don't think I would have had that at your age. So bravo. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Thank you. Okay, so I think um, we're ready to take the vote on the resolution. Um, uh, the motion was presented um, by Christian to for the board to adopt the LGBTQ plus inclusivity resolution, and it was seconded by Dr. Hager. So if we could do a roll call vote. Ms. Ross? No. Ms. Crosby? Abstain? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. 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 Mr. Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Dr. Yes. I'll abstain. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. So the resolution is accepted. Good job, Christian. <laughs> That is that does conclude my report. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you. One moment. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that I call on Mr. Brusades. Good evening, Ms. Scott. Nothing to report from closed session. Thank you. Next. Okay, thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that, I call on Ms. Jost, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, the Building and Contracts Committee met earlier today, and we reviewed contracts M1 to M11, and we bring that to the board for approval. Thank you, Ms. Jost. Do I have a motion to approve items M1 through M11? So moved, so moved. Hoffman. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? Madam Chair, could we separate out item 8, ASI 817-21, and item 9, JBO-702-21? Okay, so you, I want to make sure you want to separate out items 8, eight and item 9 under new business contracts M. Is that correct? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then, uh, then do I have, I guess, it, would I need to restate the motion, uh, Mr. Mercedes, because then now, okay. So then do I have a motion to approve items M1 to M7 and M10 to M11. So moved, Ms. Pasteur. Thank you. And no second is needed. Comes, it comes from the committee. And uh, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Cross? Yes. Ms. Cross? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McCoy? Yes. 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 Mr. Thomas? Terrible. Except Mr. Offer? Yes. Yes. Dr. Hager? Mr. Hume? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So those carry. So the items separated out will start with uh, M8, which is ASI 8-817-21 modification. Job order contracting, construction, and facility maintenance, repair, and operations. Any questions? Any discussion? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. Yes. Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. I just am going to recuse from those two contracts. Thank you. 
Okay, so you're recusing from those two contracts, eight and nine. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, so do I have a motion to approve items M8 through M9? So moved. Offerman. Is there a second? Oh, sorry, no second is needed because it comes from the committee. <laughs> All right, um, may I have any, um, any discussion? No? Okay, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rossi? Yes. Ms. She, she recused. 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 A recused. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Hester? Yes. Dr. Hager? The last two. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, moving right along. The next, I, oh, yes, Mr. Offerman. Given the lateness of the hour, can we uh, look at the uh, the agenda and see if, there's, if some of these items can be uh, can be postponed to the next board meeting? Okay, let's see. Okay. Let's go through. Madam, Ch Madam Chair, I, I know that uh, the schools, we need to do the, um, the special project requests. Uh, we can postpone Dr. Wheatley Phillips on report on graduation. It was specific around bridge projects that was related to the board goals. And we can do another update and, um, about graduation once M MSDE gives the official graduation numbers in february so so what about, what about p i think p was a request from a board member um and and probably I, from rod was that yeah. from mr mcmillian yeah it was from the committee Oh, what's that? Ms. Scott? Yes. Just a suggestion. If there are, if nobody objects to N, can we just approve them all and move on? It's the special projects requests. Yeah. I mean, we can fly through that. Okay. And then we can get to O, and that may be important. It's capital requests. I don't know how long that'll take. So if I may respond, oh, no. the special projects, I think we can group them. And to your point, Mr. Kuhn, um, the report on the state capital is just going through the schedule, and I'm looking at Dr. Scriven, um, and I, we can postpone the report. Again, I kind of gave the report in five seconds based on what your goals were related to graduation and bridge. So there's some amendments that we can go through. So um, how would the um, assembly feel about postponing O, P, and Q? I'll make that Ms. Scott, this is Rod McMillian. Yes, Mr. McMillan. The audit information has been hanging out there for months. Can we let Ms. Bard take a couple minutes and get through this? And that is P? P, letter P. Okay. So then um, would everyone be fine with postponing O and Q? Yes. No, I, I would not support <clears throat> um, okay. Postponing item O. There's a schedule of the state capital. Okay. Well. That. Okay. Go ahead, Miss Hen. I. Is a table. Move to table. Postpone. 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 I'll move mm -hmm. to postpone. Items O and Q. Till is the next um, board meeting. Second. So items. Miss Hen made a motion to 
postpone items O and Q to the next board and meeting. S. Mr. Dixit, we couldn't hear you. Could you come up? He's doing S. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to say a few things. Item O will only take a minute. It is the first reader of the capital budget, and it has to meet. Oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Dixit. Um, you were saying that there's a state deadline because we were going to postpone it. So you're saying that we should still That's hear right. it? That's okay, so we were on N then. Can we just. Uh, do like what um, uh, the great suggestion for Mr. Kuhn, um, just go ahead and process in, and then I guess we'll just go ahead with O. All right. Okay, so just give us Excuse one. Me, there's a, there's a, there's motion, a motion on, on the floor. floor. Yeah, and it was properly seconded. Unless, unless Ms. Hamm wants to withdraw it. Madam Chair, may I withdraw my motion? Yes, you may. I withdraw my motion. Thank you for that, Ms. Hen. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the consideration of a privately funded capital project for Gunpowder Elementary School, and for that, I call on Dr. Roberts. If, if I may speak on behalf of Dr. Roberts and okay. Ms. Byers, I think the request was to group all of these special projects, Gunpowder, Powder, uh, Perry Hall High School, uh, and the 7th District. As you can see, what um, the funding is representing so I'll turn it back over to yeah. Okay, Madam then. Chair. Madam so Chair, I'd like to approve them separately, if we may. Oh. oh, you want to approve them separately? Yes, please. Oh, okay. I thought the suggestion was that we wanted to approve them together. So, just okay. Quick, quick so, votes. certainly. So we just did. Um, may I have a motion to approve the privately funded capital project for Gunpowder Elementary School's outdoor stage area? So, so moved. Hen. Is there a second? Second, Thomas. <laughs> Any discussion? No, no. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rouse? Yes. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Yes. 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 Dr. Hager? Yes. Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Yes. Okay. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of a privately funded capital project for Perry Hall High School. And um, may I have a motion to approve the privately funded capital project for Perry Hall High School's ball stop netting on the stadium field? So moved. Moved. Ten. Ten. Is there is there a second? Second. Second, Ms. Pasture. Any discussion? No. May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Ms. Brown? Yes. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now we can go to item L, which is Mr. Dixon. No, there's the third one. And three. Oh, wait a minute. You're almost Oh, there. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Flying. Okay. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is a consideration of a privately funded capital project for 7th District Elementary School. And may I have a motion to approve the privately funded capital project for 7th District Elementary? Don't move, Ms. Pastua. Don't move, Ms. Cosby. Okay. All right. Is there, a, is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Cosby. Okay. May I have a roll call vote, please? So what do we do? Yes. <coughs> yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is new business report on the fiscal year 2022 state capital budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Scriven, Ms. Ms. Saris, Ms. and Mr. Dixit. Mr. Saris. Mr. Saris is okay for this. The two of us can handle it. Okay, thank you. So good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair. Dr. Williams and members of the board. Uh, tonight we are here before you uh, just to go over the timeline uh, and next steps. Uh, as Mr. Dixit alluded to, this was time sensitive. So Ms. Sin, we thank you uh, because we have to meet a, a deadline. Uh, Mr. Dixit at this time will walk you through uh, the next steps 
of our timeline, uh, what we're asking of you as a board, and what, what our due diligence will be in terms of responsiveness to our request. So thank you, Dr. Scriven, and good evening, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. So what we are here for is introducing you the state capital budget for fiscal 2023. So it's a long process. It was uh, important that we present it to you today. We are introducing it. There'll be a detailed work session in the next board meeting. What we are requesting is that you submit all your questions on, these, uh, on, on, on the submission. Uh, there is a lot of interest in some of the projects, and we'd like to have the questions in advance so that we can provide answers in the work session. Board vote will be needed in the meeting of September 14th for us to submit it to the state on October 4th. So after the board vote takes place, there is a detailed submission required to the state. So that's why the time sensitiveness of this uh, if, of uh, this submission. If you have any questions on this, uh, let me know. Otherwise, we'll wait for the work session in the next meeting of the board. Okay, and board members, for any questions um, related to the fiscal year 2023 state capital budget request, um, we are to submit those to the superintendent by the close of business on Monday, August 16th, and then responses will be provided to the board prior to, and that's the key word, prior to the August 24th, 2021 board work session. Um, it was just, so did anyone have any questions or need clarifications or anything? Yes, Dr. Hager. So, so the questions we submit will be answered and publicly available. The answers will, be, or will they just be mail, available to us? So, depending on the number of questions and the time we have, we'll try to provide the answers here, and they'll be posted in board doc. Okay, thank you. But it, uh, the key thing is that it'll be before we have our work session, so that if we have follow-up questions or anything else, we'll have time to do that. Um, any other questions or concerns? Nine? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. Yes, Ms. Causey. Uh, email was sent. Thank you. An email was sent to the uh, superintendent um, last week about the board members receiving the uh, final feasibility, the full final feasibility reports for Towson High School and Delaney High School. What is the timing of when the board will receive those? So we have shared the summary, executive summary of the feasibility report. We don't have the full report yet. And as soon as we get it, uh, we'll send it to superintendent for his review. Okay, so, uh, yes. Sorry, Ms. Mack? Mm -hmm. Mr. Dixit, is there a feasibility study done on Lansdowne? Yes, it was done. And can the board also get a copy of that, please? Uh, let me see if I can find it. It's been some time. If we have it, we'll give it to you. Okay. I mean, if you didn't have it, where would it be? Where it's is it the, housed? It's the ransomware uh, that has caused all kind of issues, but I'm sure we can find it. So. Thank uh, you. So yeah. if you would include that in whatever Ms. Um, Causey just asked, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. Anything you'd like to add, Dr. Williams, or? No? Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, and the next item on the agenda is the report on the fiscal year 2021 Office of Internal Audit year end update, and for that, I call on Ms. Barr. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to provide you with the Office of Internal Audit FY21 year-end update. This past year brought many challenges to all, and consequently, like everyone else, many hours were spent in recovery activities associated with the ransomware attack, 
other unplanned projects such as, such as the efficiency study and the commencement of activities associated with an entity-wide risk assessment. So on page one of the document that was included in board docs, you will see higher than normal percentages for hours spent in indirect activities such as meetings, professional development, and general office responsibilities. Additionally, I wanted to point out that we lost the actual hours spent during the month of November 2020, so the chart on that page does not include the hours that we spent in November 2020. Budgeted hours were approximately 1,500 hours for the month, though. And despite some of the curveballs that were thrown our way, working 100% remotely, the Audit Services Unit was able to complete 116 risk-based audits, reviews, and follow-ups at 93 schools and 23 offices. And some of those activities included school activity fund and procurement card audits, procurement card reviews, follow-ups to school activity fund, procurement card audits, and a three-year cash analysis of all schools, and a board expenditure review and a superintendent expenditure review. Our investigative unit closed 100 cases last year. Of those 100 cases, 15 were classified as conflict of interest, 15 were related to misuse of company property, and 15 were related to payroll fraud or overtime abuse. 33% of the cases that we closed last year were fraud related, and 13% of the cases closed were either substantiated or partially substantiated. We also continue to monitor the status of management's corrective action plans related to the FY19 UHY report on procurement activities and the FY20 Office of Legislative Auditors report. All of this information was reported in much more detail to the Audit Committee at its regularly scheduled monthly meetings and as part of the document I included a summary of all those meetings. And that concludes my uh, report and I would be happy to take any questions related to the FY21 year-end update. Thank you very much for that. Were there any questions? Yes, Ms. Pastor. I just um, want to thank Ms. Barr and the people in her department. Um, they are so incredibly thorough and the committee. Um, and Dr. Williams, um, in conversations that we've had about the importance of this department in terms of helping you with closing the gap and just the importance of what their projects, that's something Ms. Rowe has talked about for a couple of years about projects that they can do. And I'm looking forward to seeing them do some of these projects that will help move our system along and help to close the gaps. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Were there any other questions or comments? <clears throat> Madam Chair, this is I apologize. Um, I believe we have to approve the work plan before we move on. I wasn't moving on. I was just seeing if anyone had any questions. Um, looks like there's one from Dr. Hagar. I apologize if it's in here and I missed it, but how, how much of your work is driven by uh, people reporting fraud, waste, and abuse versus your original work plan that's set out at the beginning of the year? So we do a lot, um, a specific number of hours for that and it's approximately about five to 6,000 hours per year that we relate or a, a lot for the administration of the hotline and to complete investigations. Now this past year was a little bit different. It was a lot lower than, um, uh, than typically we have seen in the past. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Dr. Hager, it looked like it was a question from Ms. Mack. Oh, okay. Ms. Rowe, did you have a question? Okay. Ms. Causey, did I hear you? Did you have a question? No? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, okay. Yes, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to thank you for this presentation, and uh, there were many shifts that uh, needed to take place this year, and we appreciate all staff that have uh, really been uh, creative and innovative and uh, hardworking throughout this time. Um, I did want to ask about the work plan. Um, is it typical that it's been a two-year plan, or um, 
is it previously just been a one-year plan? It's previously been a, a one-year plan. If we're moving on to the next topic, I just have some brief comments related to that, if I may proceed. Yes, because we can move on to the next topic. I was just seeing if there was any questions about this one. Um, but uh, Ms. Calls, is your questions about the the next topic, the work plan? Yes, I can wait till um, okay. we do that. Thank you. Yep, okay. So we can, um, the next item on the agenda is the consideration of the proposed fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 Office of Internal Audit Work Plan. And again, for that, we call on Ms. Barr. Thank you. So the proposed audit projects and other audit activities for our work plan is rather ambitious. However, due to the global pandemic and the ransomware attack, we felt the importance of conducting an entity-wide assessment of risk and controls combined with the identified projects are a high priority for at least the next two fiscal years. We designed this work plan to address what we consider to be higher risk areas while limiting the scope of work to what we can realistically accomplish with the available staff resources. I would like to point out that the development of an annual risk-based plan is a dynamic and continuous process. Throughout the year, we obtain and maintain current information about BCPS departments, programs, and activities for use in the risk assessment process. Additionally, we will obtain input from the board, superintendent, BCPS operational management, audit committee members, professional agencies, and peer audit groups throughout the year to identify key risks related to various governance and operational areas. We will use a realistic audit horizon strategy approach to identify, prioritize, and manage audit deems critical to the board and BCPS operations. This new approach allows us to build hours into the plan for specifically requested audits not originally captured in the plan and for urgent audit issues that arise throughout the year. This provides us with greater flexibility to address emerging issues in a timely manner and to provide quality and responsive customer service to, to all that require our assistance. We believe that a risk-based approach will allow us to continue to align with industry best practices, focus our limited resources in higher risk areas, and increase flexibility as higher risk priorities arise. In addition to being risk-based, you will also notice this, that this plan specifically identifies the type of audit activity, audit type, audit objective, and our related office goals. We hope that this approach provides greater clarity to our stakeholders as we continue to, re to refine our audit processes and procedures and approaches. This FY22 and FY23 work plan was discussed and unanimously approved at the June 22nd audit committee meeting. I want to thank you for your time this evening, and I would be happy to answer any questions related to this work plan. Thank you, Ms. Barr. It looks like there was a question from Ms. Causey related to this work plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Ms. Barr, for um, presenting this draft report, uh, excuse me, the draft work plan. And uh, I, what I started to ask is, is it typical to provide a one-year plan, um, or is this a new uh, process to present a two-year plan? This is a new process for future plans. As we move in more to the risk-based approach, um, you'll notice that it will become more of a multi-year plan, subject to change, of course. Yes, I'm subject to change, as we all know. Thank you. Um, the other... Uh, question I had is um, where in the work plan is it um, about fulfilling the board's um, request about receiving reports? Uh, that That is not in, in the work plan. That is part of our SOPs and we will um, continue to do that as part of our normal practice. That was approved by the audit committee. And uh, we did run into a little bit of an issue due to the ransomware attack, but uh, be prepared to receive key, quarter two, three, and four reports very shortly. Okay, thank you for that. And I noticed on the um, earlier report that there was a discontinuation of 
updates on the Office of Legislative Audit continuous monitoring and also the, um, so I was curious, when is that going to be reinstated um, and how is, how is that going to be um, fulfilled in the coming year? Sure. So as I uh, committed when we did remove the topic from the agenda at the audit committee meetings, it is scheduled to be brought back to the audit committee meetings in September. So that will resume at our first meeting, audit committee meeting this year. Great, thank you. That's all I have at this time. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Yes, Mr. Kuhn. Ms. Scott. Oh, I, I can hear you now, Mr. McMillian. Um, we have Mr. Kuhn, then Mr. McMillian. No, yes, please. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Barr. Hello. Um, this is um, um, pretty aggressive. I see a significant number of audits and a lot of work here, and I, I, I applaud that. Thank you for pulling all this together. One of the questions I have, um, item 26, and the audit title is Grant Administration, and it talks about, um, I mean, I know we do this every year already with the, the single audit comes in and make sure that, that grant monies are going to the appropriate place. And there's been a lot of energy and focus on all the CARES Act money that's flowing, the significant hundreds of millions of dollars flowing into our organization. And I was wondering if we wanted to maybe add one or if it would be a sub of this that would literally focus on CARES Act money just so we know that we're accounting for it appropriately and we're being, um, we're getting ahead of the game, I guess. We're not, we're not um, doing this too far in arrears because you have this down, um, num item 26 is fiscal year 2023, but I think it should just be an ongoing activity because we're re receiving significant money every year it, with uh, ESSER and whatever else, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, what have you. And we could kind of get ahead of that a little bit because it's such a flood of cash rolling in. And I know that there is, um, uh, there have been many, many questions about that. So I would just make a suggestion, and I'm not sure, um, I know this is a draft, um, how you would want to approach that. But, um, uh, you know, this is great. Um, and I think that, I, I hope you can do it all. This is really a tremendous amount of work. So I'm excited to see what comes out of this. Thank you. Um, just if I may respond, Mr. Kuhn, I have um, had conversation with the board's external auditor, Clifton Larson Allen, and um, they do believe that obviously because we had a finding in the single audit related to the CARES Act that they will have to follow up with that and there is a great possibility that it will be included as part of the single audit um, this, this coming year. So as um, you'll see there is another item in the work plan that relates to follow up to any types of findings and things of that nature related to external audit groups. So um, we will be working together with Clifton Larson Allen so that we don't duplicate efforts, but we want to make sure that um, uh, our focus is going to be the risks and liabilities um, associated with perhaps lack of internal controls, things of that nature. And as we do the risk assessment, we're not just focused on business services. We're going to be looking at every single department within the organization. Um, that's why we think it's very critical and very important to um, do the risk assessment and focus on that this year. And as we do that, if there are concerns that are communicated to us related to that particular area, that is what one of the beauties of a risk-based audit work plan is that that could rise to the top and become number three instead of number 26. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And um, I definitely don't want to duplicate effort. Um, but like I said, it's a significant amount of money and there's a lot of eyes on it. The only other item that I would, I would point out is um, um, 20, audit title IT security. Um, there are um, very specialized practices that get involved in IT security and auditing of systems. So um, I'm just wondering what your group would actually be involved with with an IT security audit, if you could explain that. Sure, and I guess the short answer is right now we don't know because uh, we have not 
talked with our IT group and we've not conducted the, the risk assessment uh, portion and, and um, conversations with the, with the IT folks. But again, the type of audit that we're looking to do is related to internal controls. So not necessarily going and delving deeply into IT security, but what processes are in place, what controls are in place to prevent certain things from happening, i.e. the ransomware attack, phishing schemes, things of that nature, that it's almost perhaps like a checklist type of thing, preliminary type of thing, that if we don't have certain things in place, then this can happen. And then we would point that out um, to management. But I can assure you that this past year, we've had the opportunity to um, participate in a variety of staff development activities related to ransomware, related to IT security, um, risk assessment, things of that nature. So. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And we do need to move along. Okay. Mr. McMillian, yeah. you're up. Yes, please. As chairman of the audit committee since February of 2021, I moved to approve the Office of Internal Audit FY22 and FY23 work plan as presented at the June 23rd, 2021 audit committee meeting. Second, Hen. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee, but thank you both. May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Yes. 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 Thank you very much, Ms. Barr. Thank you all. Take care. It's a great presentation. Thank you. Okay, and um, uh, I am, I'd like to make a motion that we postpone items Q and S to the August 24th board meeting if there are no objections. Um, is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. Discussion? Yes. I, I don't object, but can I speak to something uh, about uh, policy, like an agenda item for the next board meeting? Oh, um, or you could um, you could speak to it, or you could email it in, and we can um, include it when we have our agenda setting. Okay, can I just speak to it real quick? Is that yes. okay? okay. Uh, I was just like, oh, let me put it real quick. Um, I just request that uh, we have a presentation uh, from the Division of School and Climate and Safety and the Department of Social and Emotional Support uh, about current student mental health and wellness and resources and projects orienting and talking about student mental health and wellness um, on the September 14, 2021 board meeting. Okay, you should also probably email that over because okay, I think we actually did that at our equity committee meeting. We oh. had that presentation. But yeah, email that over so we can okay. um, look at that. So um, uh, the, the motion was to postpone Q&S. It was seconded. Um, Ms. Gover, could we do a roll call vote, please? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Yes. 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 Okay, so those are postponed to the August 24th board meeting. So then the next item is item R. And the next item on the agenda are for information item, are information items, which include the revised superintendent's rules 2372, 5420, and 5430. And then we're skipping S, and we go right down to T. And the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, August 24th, 2021, at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. And the Ms. meeting... Scott, Ms. Ms. Scott, mm, I need to is say now something. We, we didn't knock out board member comments, uh, and I do want to make one. We postponed those to the oh, 24th, yeah. Well, can I make this just as he made oh. his? Um, it's going to be very short, but I need to say it. Okay. Um, I think I, did I say adjourn? Because, yeah, I think I adjourned. I apologize. I didn't, no, but I, once I said adjourned, um, can, can you, can she, um, Mr. Mercedes, can, um, Ms. Pestor, um, even though I said adjourned, can she still make her statement? Or? Yes. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Right, Pestor. Very quickly. Um, because at the first June meeting, I was one of the people who voted for postponing 12 months to 24-25 school year. I'm going to, I'm saying now that I'm giving notice that at the next meeting, 
and I will send it out via email, that I'm going to make a motion to rescind that June motion because I realize that this staff is awesome and that they have been working continuously towards that end. And to that, I'm going to make a motion that the 12 month option for teachers be implemented beginning um, the school year 23, uh, 22, 23, which is a year later. And I'm just looking at Dr. Williams as I say it and Dr. Scriven. I'm sorry, did you just make a motion? No, I'm saying, like I'm telling you, I'm giving pre notice <laughs> of pre That you're gonna right make a motion, to okay. I'm going I'm sorry. to give it to you, but I wanted you to know in advance that I am going to make that Got motion it. to rescind. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Okay, so the next meeting will be held August Tuesday, August 24th, 2021 at 6.30. Thank you for joining us. The meeting is now adjourned. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Good night.